Hey guys, welcome to an Alt Shift X live stream to talk about House of the Dragon episode five. Oh my god, <laughs> there was a lot going on this episode. This is kind of like a like like a like a mid season finale or something. Um, this is a this is a big moment setting up so many of the conflicts for the rest of the season, for the rest of the story. So many of these relationships, these events, this episode sets up so many of the relationships going forward. Um, I, everyone has beef with everyone. Everyone has secrets from everyone else. Everyone has so much potential. <laughs> so it's uh, it's wild. We're going to talk all about the episode. We're not going to spoil future episodes. We're going to answer your questions and we're going to have a good time. So thank you for joining in to this live stream. Let's talk about it. I feel like Kristen Cole was kind of the star of this episode for me. He had so many feelings and, and so few brain cells. Um, he, he was so tortured by having had sex with Rhaenyra and broken his vows that he was willing to confess his sin to Alicent. He was ready to kill himself before the heart tree, which I thought itself was an interesting choice. I, I, I thought it was interesting that Kristen would go to a heart tree rather than to the sept of the faith of the seven say uh but then you know alicent came and and saved him um and and a alicent sort of had Kristen by the balls because she knew his secret because he confessed to her and that was how alicent found out uh that rhaenyra had lied to her alicent had had believed her friend when Rhaenyra said, hey, I did not have sex with Damon. She she swore on her mother's memory that Damon didn't touch her. And now Alicent found out that she did have sex that night, albeit with Kristen, not Damon. But then Alicent is so betrayed and so angry that Rhaenyra's lie, she sees it as such a betrayal. And, you know, that's partly why Alicent's father Otto was, was kicked out of King's Landing, is because... Alicent believed Rhaenyra and told King Viserys, hey, I believe Rhaenyra, not Otto. And so that's part of why Otto, her father, got sent away. And now she's realized that's a lie. So she makes this wonderfully dramatic entrance. Like, this whole wedding was just dramatic entrance after dramatic entrance. Like, you had Jason Lannister walk in, you had the Hightowers come in, you had Daemon walk in, despite the fact that he had just been exiled, he walks right the fuck in. And then the, the, the Royce guy accuses Daemon of murder, and then, like, it's just a whole procession of people who have beef and want everyone to know how much beef they have. But this color green, it's all about Alicent's house Hightower identity and objecting to Rhaenyra's lies, you know, placing herself in, in opposition to Rhaenyra the Targaryen. And then, of course, you got the Valerion's ascendant because the Valerion's intermarrying with the royal house, and we had all of this dick measuring about like, so you know, R Rhaenyra and Lenor's children are they going to be Valerion's or Targaryens? Because if their children are on the throne, like Corlys would love the King of Westeros to have his Valerion name, but Viserys is like, no, no, it's going to be a Targaryen thing. I, I feel like male pride is a big theme this episode like we had Viserys as his body is just falling apart he, the man is disintegrating melting into a puddle before us and his concern is like how will I be remembered you know oh I kind of wish there were a few wars in my reign so I could have proved myself you know I wish I was tested so I'd be remembered better there's a lot of like male dick measuring behind these alliances and things so, oh my god, there is, uh, there's a lot going on. Um, thank you for the super chat from Marcella De Deliveria, uh, who says, uh, House of the Dragon character alignments. Yeah, maybe the YouTuber AltDriftX might talk about House of the Dragon soon. Thanks for the super chat from Alexander, who says, Alicent and Kristen together as the head empty club this week. Yeah, I, I feel like Kristen w was not operating with, with, a, with a full picnic basket this week. A Alicent was not dumb. I, I mean, Alicent... I, I mean, Otto accused Alicent of saying, like, hey, you're thinking with your heart instead of with your brain. Um, because Alicent sort of wants to believe that she and Rhaenyra can get along. 
Um, but Otto is saying that no, like the fact of it is a lot of people will not support Rhaenyra as queen. Like we saw that at the hunt when like the Lannisters and other lords and the Hightowers are all assuming that uh, Alicent's baby son Aegon is going to be the heir to the throne, not Rhaenyra. And Alicent, you know, partly because she's so lonely and, and, and Rhaenyra is like her only friend or the closest thing that she has to a friend. Alicent wants to believe that peace with Rhaenyra is possible, but Otto is saying due to the realities of politics, there's going to be conflict. Viserys is, is, keeps on saying Rhaenyra is going to be queen. And now, of course, we've got the Valerions. The Valerions are married to Rhaenyra. So Corlys, you know, as one of the most powerful and richest lords in the realm, he's going to be supporting uh, Rhaenyra and Laenor, while people like the Hightowers, who are probably, like, you know, one of the other most powerful houses in the realm, are supporting Alicent and her baby. Let, let's have a look at the family tree, just so we all know where we are in this this situation. Um, so, Alicent and Viserys have two kids now, and Aegon, this is the baby that they uh, are thinking may be the heir to the throne, though officially Viserys says that his daughter Rhaenyra is going to be the heir to the throne. And Rhaenyra has now married Laenor Valerion, uh, who is the sibling of Lena Valerion. Lena has grown up. We saw like an older uh, Lena Valerion uh, at High Tide, which is the house of um, the seat of House Valerion. This is the castle that Corlys Valerion built with all of the money that he made from his nine voyages across the world. Um, I wish we saw a bit more of Lena, because she's, like, an interesting and important character, um, but we didn't really learn much about her this episode, apart from the fact that she has grown up an awful lot. <laughs> she's grown a lot since the last time we saw her. She was, you know, Lena was the tiny child who, uh, pr proposed marriage to Viserys, but he rejected her, so the Valarions were mad. But now that the Valarions have married Rhaenyra through Laenor, that's potentially a really important alliance. I enjoyed seeing uh, Rhaenys this episode. I really enjoyed Rhaenys's entrance. Um, I thought Rhaenys had a lot of personality in the brief moment that she was here. Um, so, yeah, it's good to see more of these secondary characters. Thanks for the super chat from Cheesebreads, who says, First we had Littlefinger, now we have Bigfoot. We sure do. Laris Strong, the clubfoot. Uh, he was fantastic this episode. I really enjoyed Laris the clubfoot. He's kind of like Littlefinger. He's kind of like Varys. He's like this sort of smart, scheming, outsider manipulator. And, you know, Laris the clubfoot maybe played the most important role in this entire episode because it was Laris the clubfoot who came up to Alicent and said, Huh... I heard that Rhaenyra is a little bit sick because Rhaenyra got a special tea from Grand Maester Melos. Because remember, um, Melos gave Alicent the uh, the moon tea, the 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 plan tea, uh, last episode to uh, end any pregnancy that Rhaenyra may have from having sex with Damon slash Kristen. Um, and Laris Strong has somehow become aware of this. I wonder how he found that out. But Laris uses this information to basically tell Alicent that, hey, your friend lied to you. Uh, like, Laris basically manipulates Alicent against Rhaenyra by telling her that Rhaenyra drank moon tea. Um, so, you know, what is Laris the Clubfoot's angle here? Is he just creating chaos for the sake of chaos? Is he like Littlefinger? Does he use chaos to gain uh, power? Because, like, you know, the Clubfoot says, like, hey, like, you know... Perhaps you're in need of an ally, the clubfoot says, which is like, hey, I'll be your friend in this conflict that I have created between you and Rhaenyra. So, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the clubfoot this episode. I also really enjoyed his brother, Breakbones, um, because uh, Harwin Strong, the... Uh, the older brother of Laris the Clubfoot. I love how uh, his father Lionel just sort of gave um, Breakbones a nod 
he just sort of nodded to his son Breakbones and he's like, yeah, I need you to go in there. And so Breakbones is like, yep, I've got this. And he just walks into the scrum, into the melee uh, and just pulls out the princess and like carries Rhaenyra out of the violence over his shoulder because like he's this big strong guy. Um, He's said to be the strongest knight in the realm. And I will, you know, he doesn't look like the strongest guy in the realm. Like he's no Gregor Clegane from looking at him. But I think they communicated really well in this moment that, like, he's the guy who, if you need something done physically, you send breakbones in to do the work. And uh, by God, he did it. Um, Evan Stenger in the live chat says, Laris gave a masterclass on subtle manipulation. Yeah, I, I thought the club foot was wonderful here. And he seems to be setting himself up as an ally of Alicent. Thanks for the super chat from Alexander, who says... Uh, not sure I'm a fan of Rhea's murder scene. Felt almost too cruel. Not sure I can ever support Daemon. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I've been saying this all along, but, like, Daemon is not a great guy. I mean, in episode one, we saw Daemon, like, going to town on the common people for fun. Well, I mean, for several reasons. But, like, we, we saw Daemon with his gold cloaks just leading this violent assault on just random common people. I mean, supposedly he was going after criminals. Maybe these people in episode one were, like, known criminals who he was bringing to justice. But, like, there were a lot of people getting cut into pieces, and he was personally enjoying it. Like, I feel like enjoying mutilating people is kind of the definition of evil, and he's been that all along. He's also been, like, politically disruptive. He's been cruel, like, insulting Otto over his dead wife, you know, cheating in the tournaments. Like, Damon, Damon is not great. I mean, he is very charismatic, and he's very fun to watch, and he's a very fun character. Um, not a great guy, and I feel like, yeah, him killing Rhea Royce here, his wife, uh, is part of that. But, I mean, there is some ambiguity here, right? Because... You know, Daemon approaches her, and then she reaches for her bow, and then Daemon sort of steps forward and grabs the horse, and then the horse rears up, and then she falls down. And so, like, Daemon did not exactly cause her to be injured initially. Uh, He starts to walk away, and then she, like, insults him, so he picks up a rock to kill her. Um... So it's like, well, what were Daemon's intentions from the start, you know? Like, did Daemon come to the Vale to murder his wife? Or did he just come to mess with her and insult her some more? Or, you know, I mean, he came to the Vale because his brother, King Viserys, told him to go back to the Vale. He was commanded by the king to go to the Vale. So I suppose that's why he did it. So he just, like, comes, you know, honey, I'm home. Uh, isn't this how you come home to your wife? You just, uh, stand hooded under a giant cloak, just stand, stand in the driveway. Hey, honey, I'm home. Um, and yeah, he kills her with a rock. So I, I think, I think Damon's not, not great, if we're being honest. Um, and while we're here, uh, House Royce is, of course, uh, the family of Bronzion Royce. So they're one of the oldest and most powerful houses in the Vale. They are sworn to House Arryn, you know, like Lady Lysa Arryn. Um, one of the the strongest allies is House Royce. They go all the way back to the First Men, uh, who fought against the Andal invasion, and they famously wear this very fancy ancient bronze runic armor of the First Men that supposedly protects them from all harm. Uh, though nonetheless, many Royce lords have died in this <laughs> magical armor. Um, Waymar Royce from Game of Thrones Season 1, Episode 1, got killed by a White Walker. He was a Royce. Uh, there was also a Royce in Renly's uh, Rainbow Guard, uh, supporting Renly Baratheon. So the Royces uh, have uh, have a role all throughout the story, and it's nice to see them make an appearance as uh, Daemon's wife, uh, though we did not know her long, sadly. I, I quite liked the dynamic between Daemon and Rhea, like, you know, we we sort of get the sense that, you know, maybe part of why Daemon dislikes Rhea is because Rhea does not take any of Daemon's shit, you know? Um, like, y- 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 you look at the dynamic between, like, Daemon and Viserys. Like, Viserys is always rejecting 
daemon and exiling him but he's always accepting him back you know like at the feast you know viserys just allows daemon to return right back in onto the high table like he just walks right up and there's like no confrontation there's no words there's no apology there's no nothing viserys just allows daemon to return despite the fact that he had exiled him you know viserys just he he, he lets daemon walk all over him Whereas Rhea Royce just took none of Daemon's shit, and uh, I think that Daemon just couldn't handle that. Um, and, you know, she seems like a pretty free-spirited person who, you know, goes off and does her own thing. Like, she told her cousin, nah, like, I'm gonna go hunt on my own, I'm gonna do this myself. You know, like, Daemon, I think, wants... He wants people to want him. He wants people to, you know, need him, and, and Rhea doesn't. So, maybe that's part of why their relationship didn't happen. Uh... Elena in the live chat says, Rhea Royce was hot as fuck. I don't care what Damon was complaining about. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what Damon was complaining about. Yeah, she she seems super cool. And I think maybe Damon couldn't handle that his wife Rhea was clearly more cool than he was. Thanks for the super chat from Neil and from Ryan. Ryan says, are we calling this the green wedding because of uh, Alicent's dress? Yeah, I mean, there's a long tradition, of course, of... Um, of weddings in Game of Thrones going badly. There's the red wedding with Rob and the phrase, and there's the purple wedding where Joffrey got poisoned. Spoilers for the original Game of Thrones series, by the way. We're not going to spoil the future of House of the Dragon, but we will spoil what happened in the original Game of Thrones show. Thanks for the super chat from Morgan, who says, can you please elaborate on House Runestone? Yeah, so, so Runestone is the castle of House Royce. I feel like we already discussed House Royce a bit. Um, There's a girl called Miranda Royce, uh, daughter of Nestor Royce, who works at, like, the Gates of the Moon in the Vale. Um, And in the fourth Game of Thrones book and beyond, there's uh, a whole sort of plot line happening with Littlefinger and Sansa and um, the Royces and the Vale, because the Royces oppose Littlefinger basically taking over the Vale. So, you know, that's that's a whole thing. Maybe we'll do, like, a video about House Royce sometime. That might be fun. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Red Salt. Oh, actually, w- one other detail that I really enjoyed about Rhea and Damon is that Rhea said, Oh, have you come here to consummate uh, consummate our marriage? Um, and she says something about, like, Damon couldn't finish. I, th- I thought it was interesting. Um, and Damon, like, the whole time was, like, not saying a word. I think it's really interesting that sometimes Damon is, like, really snarky and sometimes Damon is really insulting and saying all this stuff. Um, but sometimes Damon is just dead silent. And I think when he's dead silent, that is when he's more dangerous. Um, but he's very moody, you know? Sometimes he's chatty, sometimes he's insulting, whereas sometimes he's just dead silent and it's very scary. Um... Yeah, and it's interesting that Rhea says that, you know, King Viserys cast Daemon aside in favor of Rhaenyra. So, like, Rhea is very aware of how Daemon is angry and insecure about Viserys rejecting him and making Rhaenyra heir instead. Um, So Rhea is, like, very aware of, like, how to piss off Daemon. Um, And she suggests that Daemon might try and kill Rhaenyra, which is interesting. But yeah, she said something about, like, Daemon couldn't finish. Um, so maybe Damon has a long history of, like, reproductive failure, can't get it up or whatever, uh, and Rhea knows it. And maybe that's part of why Damon is, is so pissy with her. Thanks for the super chat from Red Salt, who says, The music in this episode was brilliant. The plot and dialogue rivaled episodes like The Reigns of Castamere. Do you think they will be able to hold up this standard? Yeah, I, I, I continue to be impressed. I'm, I'm really enjoying this show. Um, I I thought that the dialogue this episode sounded a lot more sort of formal uh, and, you know, sort of like Shakespearean, like fancy old-timey language in this episode compared to the previous episode. I suppose it's like a different writer. It it did sound a bit different, a bit more formal to me, this episode. But, um, yeah, I I enjoyed it. Um, I also really enjoyed the music when when Daemon sort of uh, made his entrance like, it was this very sort of ominous, oh, fuck, it's this guy. This guy turned up to the party. Um, thanks for the donation from Exephelios, who says, Alicent stumbling into the truth because she's unwilling to finish her sentences is usually a cliche, but it fits with her character's properness and timidness. Yeah, so I I thought the scene between Alicent and Kristen was cool. Um, because as you say, like, Alicent was basically asking Kristen, hey, like... 
is it true that Rhaenyra had sex with someone? Like, because uh, Laris the Clubfoot told Alison that, like, hey, Rhaenyra had moon tea. So Alison starts to doubt, you know, maybe Rhaenyra did lie to her. So she asks Kristen. And, you know, just like Otto in the previous episode was, like, unable to ask Viserys. Like, Otto, Otto was, like, unable to speak straight to Viserys. When Otto told Viserys that Rhaenyra hooked up with Daemon, Otto was like, must I say it, your grace? They were coupling behaviors unbecoming of a maiden. Like he, like he couldn't say they fucked, you know, like he, he just couldn't get the words out because he is so sort of proper and just sort of so like emotionally disconnected from, uh, I mean, you know, like I guess with Otto, there might be a lot of sort of trauma from the death of his wife. Um, Otto is clearly still very raw about the death of his wife. We saw that when Damon was insulting Otto. And, you know, like daughter, like father, you know, Alicent also is incapable of just saying, like, hey, did Rhaenyra root her uncle? And because Alicent sort of speaks in circles and just sort of says, oh, like, a sin was committed, like, what... Whomst with whomst, someone knew someone biblically. And Kristen's like, yeah, I did it. And Alicent's like, oh my god, like, Alicent thought that Rhaenyra, like, maybe something happened with Daemon, but now she finds out that Rhaenyra had sex with Kristen. And it's so interesting that Kristen just comes out and confesses it, just like that. Um, which shows that, you know, Kristen has has so much guilt and, and, so, and feels so conflicted and feels so horrible that he broke his Kingsguard oaths and had sex with the princess, committed treason. And he says, yeah, you know, my oath has been broken, uh, but please don't take my penis. <laughs> he says, rather than gilding me, uh, please sentence me mercifully for death. So, like, Kristen wants to die at this point. Um, and, you know, that's partly, I guess, because, you know, he told Rhaenyra, like, hey, um, run away with me. Like, like Christ Kristen feels, basically, that he cannot continue with the status quo. He cannot continue being a king's guard knowing that he soiled his cloak. Like and the cloak means so much to him because no coal has ever had a place of this much honor. Like it is the greatest accomplishment of his life that he is a king's guard. And king's guard are sworn for life. This is his life forever and he knows that he just cannot live with himself wearing this cloak and knowing the cloak is a lie, having broken the oath. And so he is so torn up about that that he's like, well, I have to live a different life. Like he just says to Rhaenyra, hey, run away with me. Let's be free. Let's get away with it. Let, 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 let's get away from this oath that I broke. Get, get away from the guilt and be free together. And Rhaenyra's like, eh, nah. Because I don't think that the sex with Kristen meant as much to Rhaenyra as it did to Kristen. She didn't, you know, swear an oath of chastity. And like, this is the first time... She's had sex. I think she wants to try some other flavors, you know, <laughs> like she likes Kristen, but like she has not fallen in love with him or anything. And she also, you know, I, I think that when she rejects Kristen here, she's also thinking about the prophecy, um, because in the previous episode, Viserys showed um, Viserys showed Rhaenyra like, hey, like the reason our dynasty exists is to save the world from the White Walkers. This is a really big deal. And I think Rhaenyra has listened to her father and Rhaenyra has accepted that like, yeah, I, I do have a responsibility to save the world. And also like, I think she has some taste for political power. So like at the same time that Rhaenyra has constantly rebelled against and chafed against her responsibilities and her, her restrictions and obligations, um, I think she has decided that she wants to make the best of it. And that's why when she's walking with Lenor, she's saying like, hey, I get it. You're gay. Uh, you want to fuck around? Well, that's fine, because I also want to sleep around. Um, so they have this very sort of modern, very, very adult and grown up and understanding uh, relationship. They, they agree to have an open relationship. Um, which, is, which is interesting, because like it's interesting that Rhaenyra is so chill about homosexuality. Um, because, like, in Westeros, like, there are people who consider homosexuality a terrible sin, and it's something that, that that's hidden. Like, noble people don't openly have homosexual relationships. It's something that tends to happen on the down low, like with Loras and Renly. Um, so it's interesting that these two are so chill with it. I mean, I, I guess that, you know, partly that might be because they are Valyrian. Um, the Targaryens and the Valerians have always considered themselves to be, you know, a different 
species to lesser humans. Uh, the Targaryens especially, they consider themselves closer to gods than to men. They practice polygamy, they practice incest. So they don't consider themselves bound by the same rules of sexuality that everyone else are. So I guess in that respect, it makes a lot of sense that Rhaenyra would not care about homosexuality as an issue. Um, whereas it's interesting that uh, Corlys, um, when he was talking about Laenor, his son, with his wife Rhaenys, he was saying that, oh, you know, it's just a phase. Laenor will grow out of being gay. Rhaenyra is hot, so they'll totally... She'll straighten him out. Uh, so, uh, so I guess Corlys is more traditional in that respect. Thank you for the super chat from Sweetness, who says, uh, Melos denying Viserys other treatments is very reminiscent of Pycelle not treating Jon Arryn properly. Seems like a grand conspiracy is afoot. Yeah, that was very interesting, wasn't it? Um, because, you know, Viserys is very sick. Um, he seems to be, like, infected from that cut in his finger that has spread to the rest of his body. Um, and we saw him being treated by the maesters Melos and Orwile. Um, and Melos is, as we've seen before, very close with Otto Hightower. Um, we've seen them, you know, whispering to each other and writing writing letters to each other and um, being all buddy-buddy. Um, so some people are suspecting... And, and, you know, it sounds like maybe the maesters are spying for the Hightowers because the maesters... Um, because the Hightowers somehow knew about Corliss's plans previous episode. But yeah, I mean, there's a possibility that maybe Melos is, like, denying Viserys the proper health care. Um, because Orwell says, hey, let's give him a herbal poultice, maybe that'll fix him. And Melos is like, nah, 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 leeches all the way. Leeches, leeches, leeches or bust. Um, and it doesn't seem to be working, does it? Like, uh, like Melos says, no, no, like, leeches have always given his grace comfort, but... Doesn't, he doesn't seem very comfortable, does he? It's like in episode two, I think, when Melos was like, oh, these maggots, these maggots are the best hope we have of saving your fingers. But in the next episode, Viserys lost his fingers. So Melos's uh, healthcare treatment does not seem to be working very well. And there's a possibility that maybe uh, Melos is deliberately letting Viserys die uh, because Melos is working with the Hightowers and the Hightowers want Viserys to die. Uh so that his son Aegon can become king instead of Rhaenyra. But but that's where, like, I think the plan might not make sense. Because, like, the Hightowers want Aegon to be heir, so they should want Viserys to live long enough to change his mind and say that Aegon should be heir instead. Um, like, I don't know if it really serves the Hightowers' interests for Viserys to die while Rhaenyra is still the official heir. But I guess maybe the Hightowers might be thinking that, well, look, we can't change Viserys' mind. Viserys has his heart set on Rhaenyra being the heir. So I guess we might as well just kill Viserys now. But I mean, like, I, it might be... I, I still think it might be more in the Hightowers' interests for Viserys to stay alive longer. Because then baby Aegon can grow up. And, you know, if Aegon is older, then he'll be a more appealing heir to the throne instead of if Aegon is still a baby, you know? So I'm not sure if it necessarily makes sense for the High Towers and the Maesters to be letting Viserys die, um, uh, yeah, but but the, there certainly seems to be some skullduggery afoot. Um, Taylor in the live chat says, "Oh, Viserys is still alive. I thought he died at the end. No, like v Viserys did not die. Um, he did like collapse to the ground at the end of the episode." And his crown fell off his head. So it's a very, it's a very bad omen. <laughs> Viserys does not seem long for this world, but uh, but the king is not dead yet. No. Thank you for and obviously like you know Viserys was coughing and sweating and puffing throughout this episode, and like you know the Valarions saw that and they kept saying, uh, "Do you want to sit down, Viserys? Like you know, we don't die yet. Not until we've married your your daughter and heir." Uh, so everyone sees that the king is, like, dying. Like, he was bleeding during the, the wedding. And I think that, you know, because everyone sees that Viserys is dying, that makes everyone really so, sort of antsy and really, like, eager to prepare for conflict. Because, like, you know, Rhaenys says this episode, hey, like, call us. Like, when the king dies, 
Rhaenyra's ascension will be disputed. Everyone's expecting conflict, so the battle lines are being drawn, the relationships and all of the grudges, it's all being thrown into stark relief. Thanks for the super chat from Austin, who says, what are your thoughts on the conversation between Alicent and Laris? Also, it's in front of a weirwood. Yeah, I, I thought the weirwood... It, it, the weirwood is such an interesting choice, because there is not a weirwood tree in the Red Keep in... Um, in the main books or in the main series. And it makes you wonder, well, maybe something will happen to that Weirwood tree in between now and later. Um, and yeah, the Weirwood is always watching, which which is interesting um, with Laris because it seems as though Laris is watching. Laris somehow knew that Rhaenyra was given moon tea last episode and, and Laris somehow knows about Alicent's, you know, doubts that he's coming and, and exploiting now. So I wonder if Alicent, if if Laris, you know, has some spies or something, like we saw Mazaria spying previously. I wonder how Laris knows what he knows. And I liked Laris, you know, comparing um, himself to a flower. He was saying that, oh, this is like a flower from Bravos, and it's interesting that it's thriving here. Uh, well, I guess he, I mean, that was about Alicent, because, you know, Alicent is in the red dress, the red flower. Alicent is not native to this place. Alicent is native to native to Old Town, and yet Alicent is is flowering, and Alicent is thriving here. And I guess maybe that might have given Alicent some confidence. Like, I guess Laris was saying, like, hey, Alicent, like, you're not from here. You're not from the Red Keep. You're not a Targaryen. You're not a dragon rider, but you can still thrive and flourish here in the Red Keep, here in the seat of power, just like these flowers. Flower power. Um, thanks for the super chat from Bandywine, who says, uh, if your name is Joffrey, do not attend a wedding. Yeah, so uh, Joffrey Lonmouth, the boyfriend of Laenor Valarion, uh, was beaten to death by Kristen Cole, which, which sucks because uh, Joffrey didn't really do anything wrong. I mean, he sort of did because, like, Joffrey and Lenor figured out that, like, okay, so Rhaenyra wants to have an open relationship. Uh, who is her lover? Like, who is it that Rhaenyra wants to sleep with? Um, and they decided that it must have been Kristen because Joffrey and... Uh, Lenor figured out that, you know, Kristen was looking extremely nervous <laughs> throughout the wedding. And so because of that, Joffrey came over to Kristen and said, hey, I know that you and Rhaenyra have a thing. You guys have a secret relationship. I want you to know that I know. Um, like Joffrey said to Kristen, like, I know your secret and you know our secret. So let's protect each other's secrets, you know? Um, which is kind of a dangerous thing to say to Kristen, because, like, that secret about Rhaenyra and Kristen could get Kristen killed or gelded, and Kristen is so aware of that. And so I think that, you know, Joffrey kind of threatening Kristen by saying, hey, I know the secret that could get you killed. Yeah, that's what part of what, like, pushed Kristen over the edge. And it is, like, irrational to attack Joffrey specifically. Um, but that's what he did. He was just so overwhelmed. Like, the pain of watching Rhaenyra dance with Lenor. Um, he's just projecting all of his rage onto Joffrey Lonmouth. And it is quite different in, um, it is quite different in the books. Um, so they mentioned that there were going to be tournaments. Um, like, seven days of feasting and tournaments to celebrate the wedding of Rhaenyra and Lenor. Um, and in the books, it's during one of these tournaments that Kristen kills Joffrey. And he kills Joffrey during a melee, which is when all of the knights fight. Like, you're actually meant to fight each other. And you're not meant to kill each other. Like, you use, like, uh, dull weapons. Um, so you're not meant to murder each other during a melee, but, like, it does happen. Like, people regular regularly die during melees. So since Kristen did it during a melee, it's sort of more forgivable. It's more excusable. Um, that Kristen killed someone. Whereas, like, beating a man to death in the middle of a wedding dance is a lot more fucked up. Um, I feel like Kristen should definitely face some consequences for this. Like, I don't think Kristen should get away with murdering someone during a wedding dance. Um, and, you know, I don't think Kristen expected to get away with it either, because Kristen was preparing to, to kill himself. Um, and I think it's such an interesting choice for, like, Alicent to save Kristen. Um, from suicide. I, th I thought that was a really good way to create a connection between them. 
Thanks for the super chat from Brian. Uh, and thanks for the super chat from Dakota, who says, both murder scenes didn't do it for me. How is Cole suppo- supposed to walk away? Um, yeah, well, yeah, I agree. Like, I feel like Kristen should have immediately been, like, arrested for killing Joffrey. Um, because, you know, Lainor, the, you know, n- the new future king consort, Lainor would want justice. Lainor would want Kristen imprisoned or killed. So, yeah, I mean, maybe Alicent, like, maybe Alicent protects Kristen, you know? I I guess we might never know, um, the aftermath of this exactly, but, um, yeah, I agree. Like, I feel like Kristen should not get away with killing Joffrey like that. Thanks for the super chat from Brinks, who says, the beacon on the high tower. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something that they've added. As far as I remember, there's nothing in the books about the Hightower beacon um, glowing green. But, um, you know, green is, is the Hightower color, and and the Hightower is the big tower in the middle of the city, Old Town. Um, and yeah, j- just highlighting for the audience that Alicent's green dress means she is embracing her, like, Hightower identity in opposition to Rhaenyra's Targaryen identity. And that's in contrast to Alicent's red dresses. Like, last few episodes, she's very prominently been wearing red colours, which, you know, I guess, in hindsight, it sort of tells us that that was her um, her friendship with Rhaenyra and her alliance with the Targaryens and her wanting to work together with the Targaryens. But now she's like, nope, Rhaenyra lied to me. I'm wearing green. I'm doing my own thing. Thanks for the super chat from Bandywine, who asks about the On The Next Episode preview. We will discuss that at the end of the live stream. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Oathkeeper, who says, Daemon did nothing wrong. He gave his wife a merciful end, rather than watch her suffer. See, that that's an interesting interpretation. And, and that's what's kind of cool about Daemon. Like, uh, you know, like th- they said in all the interviews and stuff that their goal with this show is that you know, the people will have different opinions about who the villains are and who the heroes are. It is subjective. Um, and Oathkeeper here in, the, here in the Super Chat is saying that Daemon was innocent because he did not intend for Rhea to fall off her horse. And, you know, Rhea was grabbing her bow. She fell off. She, she appears to be paralyzed. Like, she can't move because, like, she landed on her back. Like, it seems like she's damaged, damaged her spine. Um, and, Rhaenyra, and Rhea said, like, oh, you're walking away. Like, you don't have the balls to finish me off. I knew you couldn't finish, she says. And she calls him a coward. And so it's after she says that that Daemon kills her with a rock. Um, I I think that's a pretty fucked up thing to do, personally. But your, yeah, your opinion may vary. Maybe Daemon was being merciful to his wife. Maybe he figured that she was going to die because she was injured. Maybe she he thought that her life wasn't worth living if her back is broken and she can't ride anymore. In the book, it in the in the book it just says that oh, like Rhea just fell off her horse while she was hunting, and she survived for like nine days, but then eventually she died. Um, like she got up and then she just died. Um, so it seems as though in the books it may have genuinely been an accident that Daemon had nothing to do with, or maybe Daemon paid someone to throw Rhea off her horse. Um, it, we definitely are meant to be suspicious of Daemon, but in the books, it, it doesn't say what really happened. Thanks for the super chat from Matthew, who says, The juxtaposition of Kristen making a, uh attempted suicide in front of the Weirwood versus a sham wedding with the rat on looking. Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting image to end on. The, the, the final shot of the episode was this pool of Joffrey Lonmouth's blood with a rat eating the blood, drinking the blood. We've seen a bunch of rats throughout this episode. We saw some rats on King Viserys's bed last episode. We saw some rats sort of nibbling around the skull of Beleriand the Black Dread last episode. And I think what this tells us is that, like, all these lords, all these knights, all these men, all these people with all their ambitions, all of their hunger for glory and for violence, they all are descending upon House Targaryen. Like, 
vultures, like scavengers, um, eating at the corpse of House Targaryen. Everyone wants to get theirs, you know, at the expense of the Targaryens. And I think all through this wedding, like, we saw all the people who were, like, here to advance their own house. You know, the, the, the Valerions, the Lannisters, the Hightowers, the Royces, everyone's here to get what they want at the expense of the Targaryens. And Viserys is just not succeeding in holding everything together. Thanks for the super chat from Lisbeth, who says that Alicent reached her limit. She's put up with so much, and she's had enough. Yeah, Alicent really wanted to believe Rhaenyra, but um, she lied, and Alicent snapped. And, and I think it, it also reminds it, it reminds me almost of like Cersei, you know, uh, or like Tyrion, you know, like if I can't be your friend, I will be your enemy. Um, I think there's a real vindictiveness from Alicent here. But it's also like, well, what else can she do? You know, like, if she can't rely on anyone, if, if her father gets sent away, if Rhaenyra lied to her, like, if everyone's against her, it's like, well, she'll just have to be her own, just, like, hard, strong image. And, and I really like how, you know, she uses the dress. Because Alicent is not a man, she's not a warrior, she's, she doesn't have those sort of male ways of projecting strength. She's not like a rebel and a tomboy like Rhaenyra. She's a lady. She's a ladylike noble lady, and so she uses dresses as her armor. She uses courtesy as her armor. She uses, like, the traditional feminine ways of communication. And you better believe that a dress can send a message. And she sends a message <laughs> with this dress. Thanks for the super chat from Donovan, who says, I thought Lionel Strong was awesome. Seems like a cool and good dude. Loved him, just nodding to his son. Yeah. Yeah, it seems as though Lionel Strong has become a, a trusted uh, Hand of the King to Viserys. He's replaced Otto Hightower as the Hand of the King, the second most powerful man in the realm. And once again, like, he, he does not appear to be pushing his own interests he instead is just giving Viserys honest advice. Like, I like how Viserys says, oh, maybe I would have been a better king if I had battles and, like, people were, you know, I had an opportunity to prove myself. Whereas Lionel is just like, no, you idiot. <laughs> like, it's a good thing that you didn't have to fight any wars. It's a good thing that you have peace. Like, it's fine, bro. Like, I, I think Lionel is, um, is, is the one unbiased dude in this episode once again. Thanks for the super chat from CC23, who says, I adore this episode. As a lesbian, I was sad to see that gay relationship last only one episode. Can you please do a real Arya Stark vid, like you did with Tyrion? There is an Alt Shift X Arya video, but it's very old and not as good as the newer ones. So yeah, it would be cool to do an, a good Arya video. Um, we will do more character videos, like the Tyrion video. The Patreon supporters voted for a Jon Snow video, so there will be a The Real Jon Snow video on Alt Shift X in the future. Thanks for the super chat from Malcolm, who says, Do you think the dwarf drummer was Mushroom? Yeah, so there was a, a short person playing the drums, um, who maybe might be Mushroom. Um, Mushroom is the jester character um, who has all of these salacious rumors about what went down, uh, in the books. Like, Mushroom is the guy who says, Alicent had sex with Damon, Alicent had sex with Viserys before Emma was dead, Alicent had sex with Jaehaerys, Rhaenyra had sex with everyone. Um, Mushroom just has these ridiculous, crazy stories, and sometimes he's right. Um, and yeah, there was this dwarf drama, so I wonder if he might represent Mushroom? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, the co-showrunner, Ryan Condal, did hint that we will see Mushroom, or some reference to Mushroom in this season. So, yeah, maybe we'll see more of the drummer. Thanks for the super chat from Mr. Scar, who says, How was the info about the tea leaked? Yeah, I agree. That's a great question. How did Laris the Clubfoot know about the moon tea? Maybe he's working with Melos. Maybe he's... He, maybe he's got spies in the walls. Like, we saw Daemon spying on the small council from some shadowy place. Maybe Laris does that too. He says that, you know, I, I have learned how to be observant. Um, so, you know, I'm not invited to speak, so I learn to observe. Just like we saw Laris, like, eating the cookie, listening to the ladies um, in episode three. He came and sat down with the ladies. and <laughs> I love this look. Just just, just keeping his eyes open while all the drama is unfolding around him, storing the information away to, 
use later as a weapon. I, I thought that was wonderful. Um, I also just enjoyed Kristen's discomfort, his just visible pain throughout this entire episode. Um, he, he was just refusing to make eye contact with anyone. <laughs> He, he, you know when, like, a dog refuses to make eye contact because the dog has, like, you know, eaten someone's uh, casserole and is just not owning up to it? Like, Kristen is so deeply uncomfortable and he knows that he's fucked up and he just redirects all of his emotions into violence against Joffrey Lonmouth. Thanks for the super chat from Rain, who says... Uh, Damon wearing black, Alicent wearing green. Yeah, there was a lot of symbolism in the entrances, but I think it'll develop further. Uh, Inquisitor says, Joffrey Lonmouth should have kept his mouth shut. Yeah, if Joffrey Lonmouth didn't come to Kristen and say, hey, I know that you had sex with Rhaenyra, and, you know, I, you, you better keep my secret or else I won't keep your secret. Like, yeah, if Joffrey didn't do that, he would still be alive. I mean, of course, you know, it's it's not very fair that he got beaten to death for this. Um, I, I, yeah, maybe Joffrey was uh, not careful enough. But it's not like Joffrey didn't know that Kristen was, was so, like, messed up about this. So, you know. Um, thanks for the super chat from Jarek, who says, Do you think Laris is more similar to Varys or Littlefinger? He does not seem to have the realm's best interests at heart. Yeah, L Laris seems more opportunistic, doesn't he? Because he, he created conflict between Alicent and Rhaenyra by telling Alicent about the moon tea. And Laris said, ooh, like, I could be your ally. Um, so I think... Laris was creating conflict for his own sort of personal gain, aligning himself with Alicent. So I guess he seems a bit more like Littlefinger than Varys, huh? Thanks for the super chat from Zoe, who says, I don't get why Kristen is suddenly shocked that Rhaenyra wouldn't leave the throne and that he's to be her whore. Surely he knew what he was getting into. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I don't think Kristen or Rhaenyra thought it through when they had sex last night. And Kristen was very reluctant when he had sex with Rhaenyra. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that Kristen, like when he comes to Rhaenyra and says, run away with me, I, I think that he knew that that was kind of a long shot, but it was sort of his one hope. Like he just sort of had this fantasy that this is the way that I can escape from my guilt and my fear. Um, and when that sort of last hope didn't happen, uh, he was, he, he had nothing, you know, that was his, that he, he, um, he, he's he tried nothing and he's all out of options you know like that was his plan b and that was his only plan um i think that i think and i think that it's interesting like Kristen saying like i'm to be your whore you know so it's not just guilt it's not just fear it's also pride that Kristen was feeling because Kristen just can't be okay with standing there watching uh his secret lover rainiera like married to another man um Kristen's pride just couldn't handle it being Rhaenyra's whore um so you know he's got a very he's got a proud notion of how he needs to be thanks for the super chat from Rack who says they really need to call someone about these rats they need an exterminator rats in the walls rats at the banquet rat, rats in the bed um I think it is another sign. I mean, you joke, but I think it is another sign that, like, the, the castle's infested with rats. Viserys's house is not in order. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Uh, Viserys is not doing well as king. Um, thanks for the super chat from LMC Doug, who says, Daemon being accused of murdering his wife Rhea and then seamlessly transitioning to positioning for her seat. Yeah, I thought that was really cool when, you know, Daemon waltzes in, uh, his, his wife is dead at his hand, and then his wife's cousin, uh, this Royce guy, Gerald Royce, uh, comes and accuses Daemon of murdering his cousin, Daemon's wife, and Daemon says, who are you? Which I thought was such, like, a wonderfully rude, brutal answer. Like, this guy's coming and putting his heart on the line saying, you killed my cousin. And Daemon's like, I don't even know who you are. Um, and, yeah. Oh, I'm positively bereft. Such a tragic accident. Like, Daemon could at least have the grace to pretend that he's sad about his dead wife. But just like he sort of rolls with the accusation about the heir for a day, just like he rolls with the accusation that he had sex with Rhaenyra, Daemon just sort of rolls with the accusation that he killed Rhea Royce. Um... He doesn't even try to tell people that he's innocent. He sort of wants people to think that he's guilty, you know? 
Um, and yeah, then Daemon immediately goes into wanting uh, Rhea's seat, Runestone, the castle of House Royce. Daemon is like, well, since Rhea had no kids and since Rhea was my wife, I should get her castle, Runestone. And it's sort of like, well, does Daemon really want the castle of Runestone? Like, does Daemon really want to live in the Vale, which he found so boring, where men fuck sheep? Like, does Daemon really want Runestone, or is he just saying he does to piss people off? It's a little bit like how Viserys, in episode one, said, you know, Daemon doesn't really want the Iron Throne. Like, he would be bored by the responsibility. Daemon doesn't want to be a politician. He just wants to create chaos and and kill people and get attention and validation. Daemon doesn't want political responsibility, but in this episode, he's like, oh, give me Runestone just to stir up this Royce guy. Um, and Daemon said that after after this wedding is over, he's going to fly to the Vale and he's going to take the castle of Runestone for himself. So we'll see how that turns out. Thanks for the super chat from Daniel, who says, how is Viserys going to get it on with Alicent to produce more children? The guy can barely stand. I think sometimes the last thing that stops working is the reproductive organs, you know? Probably, some, probably something evolutionary there. Um, Alicent has two children with Viserys, Aegon and the daughter. And uh, yeah, we'll see how that develops. Thanks for the super chat from Sydney, who says, did anyone spot the spicy tapestries in Alicent's room? There's certainly some repressed desires in there. Yeah, that's an interesting... That's an interesting idea. Um, like, I, I think that the sexy tapestries on the walls, you know, it, it sort of speaks to the whole life and death theme. Um, you know, like the opening sequence of this series is about birth and death being intertwined and having like an orgy in the background of every second scene has, has that sort of reminder of, you know, it's all everyone locked together in this endless cycle of life and death that is the royal family, that is the species. And, you know, there are dragons in the orgy tapestries as well, which implies, um, you know, that the Targaryens especially have, like, a blood connection to the dragons. I thought it was fun that we got to see uh, more dragons this episode. Uh, we saw, I, I believe it was um, Rhaenys Targaryen on Melis, the red dragon, and uh, Laenor on Sea Smoke, the grey dragon. Uh, I mean, th that hair looks a little bit more like Lena than like Rhaenys to me, but that red dragon must be Melis, the Red Queen, Rhaenys' dragon, so yeah, yeah, that, I am slightly confused by that hair, because I, f I feel like that looks like Lena's hair, not Rhaenys' hair, but I'm pretty sure that's that's Melis, Rhaenys' dragon. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Isaac, who says, how is Daemon George Martin's favorite character? He's got Ramsay vibes. Yeah, I, I feel like George Martin's intentions with Daemon may have changed and evolved. Um, because, like, in the original version of this story, The Rogue Prince, Daemon is described as, you know, being both a hero and a villain, having light and darkness in his heart in equal parts. But I feel like the Daemon of this show, and even the Daemon of the full story... Um, is clearly not equally good and bad. Like, Daemon is very likable, but he, he's, he, he kills so many innocent people. <laughs> um, I, I don't see how you can see him as a hero. Like, maybe sort of an anti-hero in some respects, but yeah, I, I feel like Daemon as a character certainly evolved. Um, in the live chat, Dudu Majora says, How is a dragon rider chosen? Does a dragon choose its rider? I mean, we saw that... Um, we saw that Targaryens have dragon eggs placed in their cradles. Uh, so, like, true-born Targaryens often... Like, like, like the books don't really explain this stuff fully. Like, we don't know exactly how this works. Um, but true-born Targaryen babies often have a dragon egg placed in their cradle. And when the dragon hatches, uh, often, or, or almost always, the dragon bonds with the baby and they become dragon and dragon rider and that's like a lifelong relationship for the human uh humans in the books have only ever bonded with one dragon uh but dragons live longer than humans do so after the human dies the dragon often gets a new rider um so so the bonding doesn't happen always though like sometimes when they put a dragon in the cradle 
sometimes the dragon egg doesn't hatch so the kid doesn't get a dragon or and, and you know sometimes people can claim dragons later in life so like there are a lot of different ways that it can happen um it's not always consistent um it's not super well explained but yeah there are several ways that people can get dragons Thanks for the super chat from Lovell, who says, Please tell me you see them bringing the House of the Dragon story back closer to the events of Fire and Blood. Yeah, I think they're hewing pretty close to the books. I mean, the books, as always, have multiple versions of what happens. So, like, you know, in the books, um, it says that it gives us multiple versions of what happened here between Rhaenyra and Kristen. Um, and one version of the story is that Kristen came to Rhaenyra and said, I love you, let's run away together to the east. And Rhaenyra said no. But there's another version of the story where before her wedding night, Rhaenyra came to Kristen naked and said, hey, let's bone one last time before I'm married. And Kristen rejected her and said, no, I'm a king's guard knight, I can't have sex with you. So, so the books have multiple different versions of what happened here. Thanks for the super chat from Audrey, who says, The second I saw Lenor's boyfriend, I knew he would die, since he was quickly becoming my favourite character. Yeah, I, I, I liked Joffrey Lonmouth. I, I feel like Joffrey Lonmouth had, like, slightly more personality than Lenor did, honestly. Um, I want to see more characterization of Lenor, because, like, so far, Lenor is just kind of this, like, mild, meek guy, which, you know, I guess that fits his characterization in Fire and Blood, because in Fire and Blood, like, it doesn't tell us very much about Lenor, but it does say that, um, Lenor was knighted two weeks before his marriage to Rhaenyra, because it was just sort of seen as the proper thing, that he should be a knight before he marries the princess, uh, which I think sort of implies that Lenor in the books is not much of a fighter, like, he's not much of a knight, um, they only knighted him out of sort of properness and obligation rather than him actually earning his knighthood. Um, whereas in the TV show, like, we saw Lenor fighting on the Stepstones and riding his dragon sea smoke in battle. That's not in the books. The, the books don't mention Lenor being involved in the war on the Stepstones. The books do say that Lenor loved his dragon sea smoke. Sea smoke was, was the pride and joy of, of Lenor Valerion. Um, so he's into dragon riding, but in the books don't really mention him being a warrior. Thanks for the super chat from Pietro, who says, I love the trope of characters accidentally admitting a secret because they think another character already knows it. Yeah, it was, uh... It was, it was a bit goofy. Thanks for the super chat from John, who says, We briefly saw a Bolton in the episode one Joust. Is there a chance of seeing any more Boltons this season? Well, I'm not going to spoil anything, um, but, but I mean, don't hold your breath for any Boltons. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Porus, who says, Love your content. Uh, who is your favorite dragon? Um, well, we had talk about Vega. Uh, in a previous episode, the oldest and biggest Targaryen dragon alive. Uh, I am uh, excited and hopeful to see uh, Vega. I thought Sea Smoke looks cool, and yeah, we've also got Melis, and we've got uh, Cyrax, the yellow dragon of Rhaenyra, but I think Caraxes is best boy. Caraxes is uh, Daemon Targaryen's dragon, and he's just got so much personality. Like, he's so squeaky. He's got his absurdly long penis-shaped neck. Uh, he, he's so weird and ridiculous. He's got, like, his back, legs, wings. He's, he's, he's so weird and freaky and moody, and uh, I, I enjoy him very much. I, I think it is so great how they've given the dragons unique sounds to go along with their unique looks. It is very important, because we are going to have to tell these dragons apart in this story, so it's good that they are characterizing them. Thanks for the super chat from Henry, who says, What was Jaehaerys' legacy that Lord Strong said was so great that Viserys continued? So Jaehaerys' legacy was peace, basically. Like, Jaehaerys was, like, the first king of Westeros that didn't cause a bunch of wars and bullshit. This is Jaehaerys Targaryen. He's the grandfather of Viserys, and Viserys inherited... Jaehaerys' throne. Because, like, the, the Targaryen, like, the history of the Targaryens is that, you know, Aegon the Conqueror took over Westeros um, with fire and blood alongside his sister wives, Rhaenys and Visenya. And they killed a lot of people. Like, Aegon seems like a decent guy as far as 
people who conquered continents go. Like, Aegon was a good politician, and Aegon was good at, like, creating alliances and, like, creating peace. But, like, he started by burning thousands of men and killing a bunch of people. And, con and like, sure, like, according to Viserys, he, you know, he had a dream that he must take over in order to save, to save the world from the White Walkers. But he killed a lot of people. And then uh, Aegon's son Aenys inherited the throne, and he was just a bit shit. Like, he was just weak, he was not a good politician, he was kind of oblivious, um, and the Faith, like, rebelled against him because of his incest, um, marrying his children together, and, like, he just did not have his shit together, and he very quickly died young, uh, possibly murdered by his brother Magor. And Magor was this warrior, he was cruel, he was selfish, he was an asshole. He married six different wives and didn't produce children with any of them. So so like with Daemon, there's a bit of a, you know, reproductive failure being, like, associated with evil in some ways. So Magor was horrible, he, he took the faith to war, he killed a lot of people. Um, and then he died on the Iron Throne, and then his nephew, Jaehaerys, inherited the, inherited the throne. And Jaehaerys was, like, the one who said, okay, guys... Settle the fuck down. <laughs> like, calm down. He made peace with the faith. That's why they call him the conciliator. Um, and, he just, and, he, and, he, and he just sort of played the right balance of showing strength, but also showing mercy and, like, listening and talking, but also going to war when necessary. Like, they say that he had a peaceful reign. There were some wars. There were, there were a few little wars here and there, but he dealt with them well. Um, and he made all these progresses, traveling around the Seven Kingdoms, listening to the lords, listening to the common people. He listened to his wife, the queen, Alisane. She was very influential, created, like, these reforms, um, that made life better for, like, women and for common people. So, like, he, he built roads, he built infrastructure, he's like, hey, like, maybe we should have some decent drinking water in this city. He, he just, like, genuinely made a lot of good decisions. He ruled for a very long time. Uh, and it was, like, the first, like, good, long, peaceful reign in Targaryen history. And so that is the legacy that Lionel Strong is talking about here. He's saying that, you know, hey, like, Viserys, like, you know, maybe you didn't win any glory in wars, maybe you didn't do anything super cool, but, like, you know what? You continued Jaehaerys' legacy of peace and prosperity, because despite all of the political tension we see now... Viserys' reign was still long and peaceful and prosperous, and things were pretty good, you know, relatively speaking. So that's what Lionel is talking about when he says that Viserys continued Jaehaerys' legacy of peace. Thank you for the super chat from Lucas, uh, and thank you for the super chat from All Right Snail, who says, I thought the problem with Rhaenys becoming queen was that her kids wouldn't be Targaryens. But Rhaenyra can just choose which family her kids belong to. Kind of wild. Yeah, so that was the negotiation between, um, between Corlys and Viserys, where they're saying that, like, okay, we're going to marry the heir to the throne, Rhaenyra Targaryen, to Laenor Valerion. Um, Rhaenyra is a Targaryen, Laenor is a Valerion, and traditionally, the wife takes the surname of the husband. Um, but Viserys is saying, yeah, no, like, this is the Targaryen dynasty, um, and we want to keep the Targaryen name, so, like, when, like, so, like, so, v Viserys says that, like, okay, fine, like, when Rhaenyra marries Laenor, she can take the, uh, the Valerion name, and, and their children can take the Valerion name, but when they take the throne, they will be called Targaryen, not Valerion. So, you know, it's sort of, like, enforcing, like, Targaryen supremacy over the Valerions. The Targaryens are still number one. Whereas Corlys kind of wanted the Valerion name on the throne, partly out of, you know, his pride. Um, but also, you know, that would seem to make the Valerions the new number one house, you know, um, ahead of the Targaryens, which would be a big shift. Um... So, yeah, it's interesting to see that negotiation. I, and I thought it was funny that, you know, like, they talked about uh, the Targaryens and the Valerions are, like, the two pillars, the, the two Valyrian families, because, of course, the Targaryens and the Valyrians are uh, both from Old Valyria originally, which is the Dragon Lords, the great empire that fell like Atlantis, and they alone have the blood of the dragon and can ride dragons. Um, I thought it was funny that they said, you know, we are the two pillars of Old Valyria, because, like, in the books, at least, the Valerions and the Targaryens are not the only Valyrian families in Westeros. 
Um, there's a family called House Celtigar, uh, and they have uh, crabs as their heraldry, and they are also a Valyrian family. They are less powerful than the Targaryens, less powerful than the Valerians, but they are Valyrian, and so it's so funny that <laughs> throughout House of the Dragon, the Targaryens and the Valerians are just constantly saying, yep, we're the only Valyrians that matter. Fuck those crab people. We don't care about the Celtigars. But the Celtigars have a Valyrian steel axe in the books, which is cool. So, you know, very disappointing to see this Celtigar erasure once again. Thank you for the super chat from CJ, who says, I wonder if Laris and Mazaria are partnered in the business of Little Birds. Yeah, that would be cool, wouldn't it? Mazaria the Spymaster and Laris the Clubfoot. The, the the White Worm and the Clubfoot. I like how they both have, like, stage names, you know? Clubfoot and White Worm. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Brandon, who says, Bronn did say that ladies fall from their horses and snap their pretty necks all the time. It's so sad that we saw that reality. Poor Damon. <laughs> what a shame that Rhea Royce died, leaving Damon the uh, inheritor of Runestone. What a goddamn shame. Yeah, so that is the same thing that uh, Bronn was planning with his uh, beloved lady wife, Lollis. Uh, because in Game of Thrones Season 5, Bronn gets married to this uh, sweet, innocent uh, woman, Lollis Stokeworth. And Bronn... Seems to be planning to murder her and take her castle, but, um, which is which is sort of what happens in the Game of Thrones books. Um, it, it does, yeah, these poor accidents seem to happen to people when they are um, in line for a castle. Thanks for the super chat from Darth Wick, who says, Rhea finally shows up and then instantly dies and refuses to elaborate. Yeah, look, I thought Rhea was good. Like, she made an impact. You know, I think that... She was cool and likable, and so it meant something when she died. Um, and, I, I, yeah, I think it's interesting people's reaction to her death. Like, are people uh, thinking that Daemon is a monster for this? Um, or do they think it's an accident that Rhea died and Daemon just put her out of her misery? There are different ways to interpret this. I really enjoyed uh, when Viserys was, like, puking his guts out on the ship. Which, again, you know, makes him seem just sort of weak. Uh, and then Lionel has to come along and bring the king a wet wipe to wipe up his puke uh which reminds me of that line from game of thrones uh the the king shits and the hand wipes is what they say about the hand of the king like the king creates the mess and the hand has to deal with it and that's what we saw with lionel <laughs> looking out for the king's puke uh we got to see high tide we got to see lena brought up um you know, I thought it was interesting with Otto and Alicent when Otto was saying, like, there will be conflict between you and Rhaenyra. And it's sort of like, you know, th th there's truth to that, but it's also like maybe this is a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know? And I mean, none of this would have happened if Otto didn't push Alicent to hook up with Viserys. Like, you know, like, I, I think that Otto does come across as sympathetic a lot of the time. Like, a lot of the time, Otto seems like he's just trying to do right by the realm, or he's just trying to protect his daughter. Like, that's how he seems in this scene. But, like, we've got to remember that the only reason why his daughter is in any danger in the first place is because Otto pushed Alicent to hook up with Viserys, and the reason he did that was for the political ambitions of House Hightower. So, you know, as much as Otto may seem sympathetic sometimes, I, I think that he put Alicent in this dangerous position in the first place. Um... I thought it was interesting how Viserys was, like, constantly trying to avoid any kind of political talk throughout this episode. Like, he tried to avoid talking about Rhea Royce, he tried to avoid talking about succession issues. You know, Viserys just wants people to get along, he doesn't want to deal with the difficult issues, and that allows the issues to fester, just like the infections in his body. Uh, I really enjoyed Lena Valarion's line when they arrived at Driftmark, and Lena said to Alicent, Let's, let us go and discover what might be had for breakfast. That's going to be my new line every morning. Let us discover what might be had for breakfast. Thanks for the super chat from Andrew, who says, In episode two, when everyone, including Otto, cowered at Caraxes, I thought it was amazing how Westerling stood tall. A Westeros versus Valyria moment. Hmm. So Harold Westerling is the Kingsguard knight. He uh, in introduced uh, each of the houses as they walked in this episode. This is Harold Westerling here. 
And yeah, like I, I thought there is that sort of constant sort of tension between the Valyrian dragon riders and everybody else. Um, and we got a sense of that when, you know, this episode, Viserys announced, you know, this will be the beginning of a second age of dragons. And everyone in the hall claps and goes like, yeah, great, second age of dragons. That sounds fantastic. But like, you know, the field of fire was not that long ago, you know, like thousands burned on the field of fire. You know, dragons burned the Sept of Remembrance, the the greatest sept in King's Landing. Like... An age of dragons does not sound like an entirely good thing to everybody. And so when we talk about like a Grand Maester conspiracy against the dragons, because in the books there are people who claim that the Maesters have a conspiracy against the dragons to destroy the dragons, because it's like, well, dragons create so much death and instability, and dragons make it impossible for anyone to question House Targaryen. So when you end up with assholes like uh, Maegor the Cruel, no one can do anything about it because of the dragons. So, like, when Viserys says, this will be a second age of dragons, I think that a lot of the lords in that room are going, ugh, we do not want a second age of dragons. I thought that uh, Jason... Lannister, when he rolled in, was uh, very funny. True to form, he was trying to be like this, you know, slick talker. And he just says this, like, misogynistic thing of, ah, you know, women... Women always be late. You know how women be. Women getting ready with their makeup when we men are doing the wars. Ah, women, women be women be making sandwiches. Uh, Jason's sort of like casual buffoonish misogyny, I think, was funny. Um, and you know, it, it is great that we've got Jason Lannister and his brother Tyland Lannister played by the same actor because we get to enjoy the contrast between them. Um, because while Jason is sort of this like over arrogant rich frat boy uh, uh, dingus. Tyland Lannister seems to be this sort of like hardworking, uh, long suffering younger brother who's sort of doing his best politically, but doesn't have the same arrogance that his older brother Jason does. So I, I enjoy the characterization. Yeah, women be shopping. That's what Jason was saying. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Hannah, who says, Could the unusual nobles fighting and deaths? represent how the Targs and Viserys are causing the moral decline of Westeros, or were kings always so hands-off? Yeah, so, like, there has been all this random violence breaking out, you know, the the Bracken fighting the Blackwood and the Knights fighting at the tournament, and now Kristen killing Joffrey Lonmouth at the, at the wedding dance. And we've talked before about how that indicates that, you know, there's a lot of, like, that there's a lot of ambitious... Um, men who want to fight for glory. But I agree that I think that that speaks to the Targaryens' failure to impose their authority and keep the peace. Like, part of the whole sort of political contract in Westeros is that the king is in charge in order to guarantee peace and justice for everybody. Um, The king gets the power and the people get the peace. That is meant to be the agreement. But, you know, all too often, uh, the king does not succeed or uphold that duty to provide peace. And I think part of the way that the king needs to provide peace is by wielding authority. Like, the king needs to guarantee peace by having the biggest army and having the most strength and saying, no one disrupts the peace of the realm or else I'll disrupt the fuck out of... I'll make pieces of their head if they try and break the peace. The king enforces the peace with strength. And I think throughout all these episodes, Viserys constantly fails to project the strength needed to enforce the peace. And that's partly by stuff like, you know, Daemon slinks into the hall, despite the fact that Daemon has repeatedly broken the peace, repeatedly broken laws, repeatedly created chaos. Viserys has repeatedly sent him away, but Daemon keeps on slinking in. He got this big fucking grin on his face, big shit-eating grin, because Daemon knows that he can just get away with it over and over. Daemon fails to assert, Viserys fails to assert his authority as king, and I agree, that's part of why everyone disrespects Viserys' authority, by starting fights, by doing their own shit, by breaking the rules. Um, Viserys fails in his duty as king to keep the peace. Thanks for the super chat from Alex, who says, How did Joffrey know that Rhaenyra's lover was Kristen Cole? At that point in time, only Alicent knew. 
did Joffrey simply guess it was Cole by his body language at the wedding? Yeah, I think that's exactly what happened. Um, because, you know, Lenor and Joffrey were discussing, like, you know, who is Rhaenyra's lover? Like, what is the deal there? And I think that they correctly just sort of look at Kristen um, and sort of see how uncomfortable he is. Because it is very obvious how uncomfortable Kristen is. So I guess they just sort of guessed. And, and maybe, you know, when Joffrey came up to Kristen Cole and said, Ooh, I know your secret. Like, maybe similar to the conversation with Alicent and Kristen Cole, maybe Joffrey did not know for sure that Kristen was the lover, but he was just sort of feeling it out by talking to Kristen. And when he was talking to Kristen, he just sort of figured it out by talking to Kristen that, you know, he was the secret lover of Rhaenyra. And, you know, it, it's sort of interesting that that is the case because I don't know if Rhaenyra even does completely think about Kristen as her secret lover. Like, yeah, like, she was smiling and, like, into him the next morning in the previous episode, but I think that Rhaenyra is not totally got her heart set on Kristen. Like, I think that she's she's young, she's a teenager, like, crushes can pass quickly. She only hooked up with Kristen in the first place because he was just the nearest dude who she knew. Um, so, I, I don't know if Rhaenyra even saw Kristen as her dude at this point entirely. I think she was open to options. Like, th there's still tension between um, Daemon and Rhaenyra. Like, there's clearly sexual tension between these two. Like, we see Daemon, like, really get up close and personal with Rhaenyra. And Rhaenyra said, like, Oh, what if you took me away to Dragonstone and married me, Daemon? What then, huh? Cut through my father's Kingsguard, take me to Dragonstone and make me your wife. And Rhaenyra is clearly, like, taunting Daemon here, but I think that on some level, Rhaenyra is telling Daemon what she wants. I think that Rhaenyra on some level wants Daemon, and as much as she is frustrated and angry that Daemon, like, left her hanging in the sex club uh, in the previous episode, I think Rhaenyra clearly has some desire for Daemon still, and Daemon has some desire for her. So I think that Rhaenyra is still playing the field, uh, despite the fact that she is now married. <laughs> Um, it, it, the conversation that Leno and Rhaenyra had on the beach, I thought it was fun, this euphemism that Rhaenyra was using about, like, well, some people enjoy eating goose, but some people find goose too greasy, and they prefer eating duck, and that's Rhaenyra's way of saying, hey, I know that you're homosexual, personally, I'm heterosexual, whatever, it's all cool, um, it's all fine, we're Valyrians, we can have sex with who we want. Uh, and this is based on a line in the Fire and Blood book that says that um, uh, it was sort of an open secret that Lenor was gay. And a maester said, well, look, you know, like, Lenor might not have a taste for women, but I don't have a taste for fish. But when fish is served, I, I put up with it and I eat it anyway. And of course, you know, um, fish being compared to having sex with women is a is a <laughs> certainly a choice. Um, but I, yeah, I thought it was fun the way that they um, did that. And uh, uh, speaking of, of fish, did you know that you can get an Alt Shift X T-shirt at Standard TV slash Alt Shift X? It's true. Maybe you should enjoy goose or duck in a Alt Shift X T-shirt. Yeah, link below. Yeah, all right. Anyway, thanks for the super chat from Brandon Pauly and from MZ Kim, who says, Rhea didn't just insult Daemon, she insulted his sexual performance. Oh my goodness. Well, if you insult a man's sexual performance, then of course he has a right to kill you. Is that how it is? Fucking hell. Da Daemon is very insecure about his sexuality. Like, we saw that in the previous episode when he stopped having, Rhaenyr having sex with Rhaenyra, and in episode one when he stopped having sex with Mazaria. And yes, yeah, some men do respond with violence when their sexual strength is questioned. And yeah, I guess that is part of Daemon's aggression to Rhea here. Um, I think that, yeah, men with wounded pride responding with violence is definitely one of the themes. And women responding with violence to insults to their honor as well. Um, is part of it as well. And, you know, th this, like, this entire story so far, like, all of these episodes, is all about creating grudges and wounded pride. Like, I won't spoil anything, but, like, this entire season is basically, like, set up. It's like prologue, almost, you know? Like, shit gets real later. Like, this is, this is 
all, the story so far has all been about creating the grudges, creating the relationships, created all the wounded pride that is going to result in an outburst. And I, I really enjoy the the dance, like the metaphor of a dance, like this whole long scene in the wedding dance where all of these people uh, t- talking to each other, all these relationships being explored, all these grudges is all in the context of this dance. And I thought it was really cool that Lenor said to Rhaenyra, hey, like, this dance is a lot like combat. Dancing is a lot like fighting. And that's very appropriate because there is a conflict in the books that's called the Dance of the Dragons. So I think that what we're seeing here, this dance is like metaphorically the Dance of the Dragons. Like all this, all these conversations, all of this stuff, it, it kind of is like warfare. Thanks for the super chat from Vex, who says, Harwin and Laris's sloppy exposition explaining the significance of green reminded me of when an Arya line had to be added to the Game of Thrones pilot explaining that Jamie and Cersei are twins. Yeah, so fa- so infamously when they filmed the first episode, the pilot of Game of Thrones, um, a lot of people didn't get the relationships. Like, a lot of people didn't realize that Jamie and Cersei were siblings when they first watched the Game of Thrones pilot. So in the revised version of the pilot that was actually aired, they added a bunch of extra dialogue where like there's a there's a voiceover from Aya where she says, oh, Jamie Lannister, he's the brother of Cersei Lannister. And they sort of explain stuff. I think it was not so egregious when um, Laris told Breakbones about like, oh, the beacon of the high tower is colored green. Like, I, I think that that is more of just sort of an additional detail like i i I mean the point is that allison is wearing a green dress because house hightower's color is green and they make that pretty clear when allison walks past the alice the hightower camp and the hightowers are all wearing green and she's wearing green uh and you know allison was wearing red previously now she's wearing green but yeah i think it's fine that they added a bit of dialogue just to make it really clear that this is about allison's hightower identity in contrast and in conflict with her targaryen um, the Targaryens, like right nearer. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Inquisitor, who says, I don't know if Daemon disliking a free-spirited and willful woman is in character. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 there's more than one kind of willful personality. Like, I, I think that Rhea, we, we saw that in, like, the, the, t- the few minutes that we saw Rhea, she delivered, like, four, like, really pointed barbs at Daemon. Like, this this first conversation that they have in months or years, Rhea immediately goes for the jugular with Daemon. She's like, oh, you here to fuck some sheep? Uh, oh, you've been replaced by Rhaenyra, a little girl. Oh, you can't even finish when you're having sex. Oh, our wedding is unconsummated. Like, like she is really riling him up. Um... And, you know, I, I think that she feels aggrieved by shit that Damon has done to her. Um, but she's she's really, like, provoking him. Um, and I think that, you know... So it, it's not as simple as, like, Damon just doesn't like her because she's free-spirited. I, I think that there's there's history in this particular relationship. And, yeah, like, I guess the sex thing is seems to be a big part of it. Like, you know, she, she says, Our marriage was unconsummated, and, like, I knew you couldn't finish... You can't finish it. So I guess that, like, maybe on their wedding night, maybe on their wedding night, Damon was, like, okay with the idea of, the, of of marrying Rhea. Like, maybe they originally, like, kind of were gonna maybe get along. But maybe Damon felt humiliated because, like, he couldn't perform on their bedding. Maybe he couldn't get it up. He couldn't finish or whatever. And Rhea, like, insulted him over it or something. And maybe, like, that was enough to like wound Daemon's pride. But also like part of it is just that Daemon finds the veil boring. Like there's not a lot to do in the veil. And so he just didn't want to be there. And I think it's very clear that, you know, Daemon has always wanted Viserys's approval. And and he's got such a connection to his family. Some might say too much of a connection with his family in the case of Rhaenyra. Um, so, you know, Daemon just did not want to be there, and I think that Daemon and Rhea insulted and riled each other up, and it was a, uh, bad time. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Delaunay, who says, I like Laris Strong, which makes me nervous, because I liked Talisa, Oberyn, Sirio, and Khal Drogo. Yeah, well, we liked Joffrey Lonmouth too. 
Um, and, uh, yeah, it seems like no one is safe. There has been, like, a death or two in almost every episode, I think. Thanks for the super chat from Jones City, who says, Is it just me, or can people just fast travel to King's Landing all of a sudden? Uh, I mean, we saw Daemon in the Veil, and we saw Daemon in King's Landing, but it didn't tell us how, like, long, um, how much time passed. Um, I, I think it may have been years since the previous episode. I mean, Lena Valarion has certainly grown up quickly. Uh, we don't really know what the time span is. And I don't think we really need to. Like, I think we know that these episodes are taking place, you know, a year or two apart a lot of the time. Um, and there will be more time skips in the future. Thanks. And yeah, they, yeah, they have dragons, as Irradiated Crow says. Like, the, the dragon riders absolutely can fly around pretty quickly. And, you know, keep in mind that, like, Driftmark, which is the Valarion Island, is, like, just next door to King's Landing. And also, like, the Vale is not all that far from, um, from King's Landing as well. If we look at a map... Like, in Game of Thrones, the original show... Like, there was some pretty ridiculous stuff where people were going from, like, the Vale up to Winterfell to the Wall to the Riverlands. Like, people were jumping all over the bloody continent in Game of Thrones. But in House of the Dragon, like, most of the action, almost all the action so far is happening in King's Landing, the capital here. Um, Dragonstone is just there. And Driftmark is just here. And the Vale is, like, up here. So, like, it's all pretty close by boat or by dragon. It's not like in Game of Thrones where everyone was, like, jetpacking around the continent like crazy. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Macis, who says the time jump will happen. Um, yeah, well, that's, that's book stuff that we might see later on. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Cassandra and from Mike, who says if Viserys had let Rhaenyra choose her husband... Could Kristen have renounced his vow, or is it for life? Or would that have been beneath her station? So, in this time, Kingsguard have served for life. I mean, I guess um, Lucamore the Lusty, Lucamore Strong, was sent to the Wall, and he was stripped of his Kingsguard cloak. Um, but normally it is for life, and you don't get to leave the Kingsguard to get married. I think that would be seen as... Highly unusual and unprecedented. I, I don't think Kristen Cole would be allowed to marry Rhaenyra. Um, but, you know, occasionally kings do what they want. Um, like in Game of Thrones and in the books, when Barristan gets removed from the King's Guard. Um, that had never happened before, but Joffrey did it anyway because he wanted Sandor Clegane to be on the King's Guard. And that was also um, unprecedented because. Uh, the Kingsguard had always been knights, but in when Sandor Clegane, the Hound, joins the Kingsguard, uh, the Hound was not a knight, so he was the first that also broke a precedent. So, like to a certain extent, like kings can do what they want. Like if if Rhaenyra convinced King Viserys, like, hey, I want to marry Kristen Cole, then I guess King Viserys could have removed Kristen from his Kingsguard vows, but it would have been seen as highly unusual. And also, and also, like, yeah, like, Kristen Cole is a low-born person. Um, it's not a good marriage alliance to marry Kristen Cole, and that would have snubbed the Valerions again. So, like, yeah, I don't, I don't think it would have been seriously considered Rhaenyra marrying Kristen Cole. Um... I am kind of confused about Kristen Cole's, like, background, because, like, in episode one, they said that Kristen Cole is Dornish, but they also said that he worked for the Dondarians, who are Stormlanders, fighting against the Dornish, and then he in this episode, I think they said that Kristen was a Stormlander? So I'm really, like, so are they saying that Kristen has, like, a Dornish background, but he, like, immigrated or intermarried or, like, or like somehow Dornish Kristen Cole got... But, like, House Cole is from the Stormlands. I was, I, I'm kind of confused about Kristen being Dornish. I guess, like, I guess someone in House Cole married a Dornish person, and so Kristen is considered Dornish in that sense. Um, thanks for the super chat from Overcooked Egg, who says, Can we talk about what set Kristen Cole off? He killed the Knight of Kisses, Joffrey Lonmouth, brutally. 
His oranges got rejected and he went crazy. Yeah, Kristen was super emotional. He felt super guilty. He felt super afraid about breaking his Kingsguard vows. Like, he was he was suicidal. Like, he was ready to kill himself at the end of this episode. Um, and his sort of one hope was saying, like, hey, Rainier, let's run away from this. Let's run away from all these vows, from, from this guilt, from our mistakes. Let's run away and start a new life. And I think when Rhaenyra said no, Kristen was like, fuck, like, I've got nothing. And so he confessed to Alicent and he said, like, please kill me quickly. <laughs> that was the best Kristen was hoping for. So, so he is in a wildly emotional state, super self-destructive state. And then when Joffrey Lonmouth came along and said, hey, I know your secret... And he sort of implies that, like, hey, like, I might I might tell people that you broke your vows. I might, you know, ruin your secret. I think Kristen sort of redirected a lot of his emotion, a lot of his fear, his anger, his, all of his guilt. And he just sort of expressed his feelings uh, with, with his fists by beating Joffrey Lonmouth to death. And, you know, sometimes that is something that men do. That's something that... Um, people do sometimes is that when they have a lot of feelings and they don't know how to express them they express them through violence and that's you know i mean in the context of kristen cole being a knight the only thing that kristen cole has ever been good at is fighting you know like fighting is how kristen got onto the king's guard fighting is how he won glory like everything he knows everything he is is a fighter and so i think when he's given a big old bag of feelings that he doesn't know how to handle he's like well I will express this the only way I know how. With me fists. He's not a smart guy. He's not a smart guy. Enoch in the live chat says that Kristen isn't Dornish. They said in the first episode that he is Dornish. And they've said in, like, the behind-the-scenes stuff that Kristen is Dornish. I guess that he's, like, part Stormlanders, part Dornish. R Raziath in the live chat says that the Dornish Marcher lords are Stormlanders. That Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. Like, it's in the Borderlands. The, Marcher, the Marchers are the borderlands between the Stormlands and Dawn. So I guess there would be, like, intermarriage and stuff going on there. That that makes sense. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Brinks, who says, What color does the Hightower glow? Um, is Hot D confirming the Hightower maester conspiracy? I think there was clearly an understanding between Otto Hightower and Melos. Um, especially, like, in the scene where King Viserys told Otto... Um, that the Valarions proposed marriage. Um, and Otto and Melos had these very sort of, like, knowing looks between each other. Um, and I think that was definitely indicating that, like, there's an understanding between Otto and Melos and they're working together. Like, there were some real glances passing between them. Um, but, w you know, and, and I think that they're just basically trying to support um, Aegon Targaryen, Otto's grandson, as the heir to the throne. But whether they're also trying to let Viserys die, or whether they're trying to work against dragons in general, there's a lot of open questions. You know, are they spying on people through the letters? There's a lot of open questions with the Maester Conspiracy, I think. Um, BLN in the live chat says, How many generations are there between this and the Mad King? Uh, it's a bunch. It's a bunch. Um, after this particular fracas goes down, um, there's like a... Uh, there's a Baylor... That, well, there's a Dayron. There's a King Dayron. There's a King Baylor. There's a King Viserys. There's a King Aegon. There's a King Dayron. There's a King Ares. There's a King Micah. There's a King Aegon the Fifth. There's a King Jaehaerys, and then there's King Aerys, the Mad King. And then there's King Robert, and then there's King Joffrey, and then there's King Tommen. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a bunch of time. It's like 170 years, or 180 years. No, it's like, a, yeah, it's like 185 years from now until Game of Thrones. So there's a lot, there's a lot more Targaryening to come. But we know that, like, in, uh, for a long time, like, at the time of Game of Thrones, there's no dragons. Um... So something happened in between now and then. So you got to wonder uh, what what happened. Thanks for the super chat from Twentieth, who says the beginning of of Otto's speech was brilliant. Also the size of Vega. Well, we'll talk about the trailer later. Thanks for the super chat from Brazen, who says the young Maester Orwile offered a better solution for the cuts, but was shut down by the Grand Maester. Yeah, maybe the Maesters and Melos are trying to deny good healthcare. 
Um, thanks for the super chat from Alex, who says, I love you, bro. I aspire to be your berserk counterpart. Who would you rather be, Robert or Viserys? Ooh. Um, I mean, Robert is a worse person than Viserys. Like, Viserys is not very good <laughs> at anything, um, but he does at least try to do the right thing, whereas Robert was very happy to just marinate in alcohol and just eat himself to death, and he was pretty horrible to Cersei. I mean, Cersei is a horrible person, but, like, Robert, like, hit Cersei and, like, had sex with her, like, raped her when she didn't want to have sex, and, you know, Robert is a violent person, and, you know, that that sort of makes sense in terms of his character because, you know, in a similar way to what we were saying with Kristen Cole, like, Rob, Robert has only ever been good at violence and that's the only way he gets anything good in life, so violence is all he knows. But yeah, Ro Robert is a worse person than Viserys. I, I mean, I think that in the books, Viserys is worse than how he is in the show. Like, show Viserys is more of a... Like, Viserys actually tries in the show... Whereas in the books, they talk about Viserys mostly just letting Otto do all, of, do, do all of the politics for him. And Viserys also, like, eats a lot and becomes very fat later in life. Um, whereas in the show, Viserys is not quite as apathetic. He's not quite as self-destructive. He's more just sort of hapless and unsuccessful, <laughs> despite his best ambitions. Uh, so, yeah, I think Viserys is a better person than Robert. Um, I think that Robert probably has more fun than Viserys, so maybe it would be more fun to be Robert. Thanks for the super chat from Unsourced Wall Radio, who says, I don't understand why folks are mad at Kristen. That Joffrey guy was asking to die, borderline blackmailing a king's guard. Yeah, I don't think Joffrey realized um, how dangerous uh, he, he was being when he, you know, told Kristen, I know your secret. But I mean, you know, like, you can't blame Joffrey for Kristen beating him to death. Like, like it was a mistake to tell Kristen, I know that you had sex with Rhaenyra. But, I mean, I think Joffrey was thinking that, like, Kristen could be chill about this. Like, Joffrey and Lainor have managed to be chill about their relationship. Like, they're out, you know, making out in the sand dunes. Like, and, and you know, Corlys knows that Lainor is gay, and Rhaenys knows that he's gay, and Rhaenyra knows that he's gay. Like, it's sort of an open secret. So I think that, you know, Lainor and Joffrey made the mistake of assuming that Kristen would be, a, would be as chill as they are about having a secret affair. But Kristen is just anything but chill. There's there's nothing worse than than someone who takes themselves this seriously, you know? And I mean, the tragedy of all this is that his crime was love. His crime was having sex, you know? And and why is that so bad? And like, like we said in the video, like, that is what Ariane Martel says. Because in the books, there's this character called Ariane Martel who has sex with this Kingsguard knight called Aris Okart. This is art by Magali Villeneuve. And, um, and Arian says, like, y you should not be ashamed of having sex with me. You should be ashamed of serving King Joffrey and serving King Domin. Like, you should be ashamed of all these wars and all this violence and all this bullshit that you have participated in. You should not be ashamed of having sex and making love. That, 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 that should be fine. And that's partly, like, the, the Dornish um culture because the dornish culture is like more relaxed about sexuality and more relaxed with having paramours whereas all these uptight bloody westerosi knights are all like yeah i don't mind killing people but if i have to make love to someone ooh, there's gonna be trouble then it's like really so partly this is george martin like criticizing this honor system and criticizing this system that is built on violence but won't allow love and of course you know like the logic of all of this um, you know, sexual control is that the whole notion of, like, medieval dynasties inheriting power is based on, you know, marriages and agreements and sexuality being controlled and women's bodies being controlled. That is the foundation of this political system. Um, and what we're seeing is that when you, when you base an entire political system on people keeping their junk to themselves... Sometimes there's problems because people have feelings and people have sexual desires and uh, this show is all about exploring the consequences of a political system that is based on an impossible degree of control over people's hearts and junk. 
Thank you for the super chat from Beth, who says, I want coal eaten by a dragon, and not in a pretty way. <laughs> uh, I, I love everyone uh, forming their opinions on whose side they are on. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Non Dominant, who says, Sir Down of House Bad. <laughs> Kristen is down bad. Thanks for the super chat from Peter, who says, What do you think of the overall lack of fantasy elements in the show so far? Apart from the occasional dragon, I'm missing magic, dark prophecies, presence of mysterious gods slash beings. Seems like more of a political drama. I mean, Game of Thrones has always been mostly a political drama with occasional flickers of magic. That's how George Martin likes it. Um, I think that in some ways House of the Dragon has been more magical than Game of Thrones was. Like, it's only been four episodes, and we've already seen, like, a secret prophecy with the prince that was promised talking about White Walkers, and we've seen, like, Viserys having prophetic dreams about his son... Um, and we've seen all sorts of dragon stuff, and, you know, we saw the White Heart appearing to Rhaenyra, which felt very, very much like a sort of a mystical omen, you know, supernatural or not. Um, and what we saw in, you know, Game of Thrones was a slowly rising amount of magic. Like, the first season of Game of Thrones had pretty much no magic on it until Daenerys hatched those dragons and survived the fire and stuff. There was a gradual increase in the amount of magic, and maybe we'll see something like that in House of the Dragon. But but I will say that, you know, House of the Dragon, the story of House of the Dragon, it, it is focused more on human drama and political drama. And there's a there there's a there's a fuckboat of dragons as well. But like, you know, I don't expect too much Expelliarmus and Devadakadava ing in this. It, yeah, it's not a super magical story. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Mother Nix, who says, Maybe Melos is keeping Viserys an invalid instead of outright killing him to keep him weak. Yeah, I think that's a good theory for a potential, like, Hightower maester conspiracy. Like, maybe they're not trying to kill Viserys, they're just trying to make him easy to manipulate. Because as long as Viserys is super weak and reliant on the maesters, he's sort of easier to manipulate. So maybe they are hoping that when he's weak they'll be able to sort of seize the reins of power and make Aegon the heir. Yeah, I think I think that's a reasonable interpretation. Because, um, yeah, like, it wouldn't be without precedent for a king to be, like, sick or indisposed. And while he's indisposed, maybe the hand of the king or the regent or whoever would be able to sort of change things and to maneuver in such a way as to make Aegon the heir. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Game Inspection, who says, Do you feel that assumption is a big theme in the story? Characters act on assumptions. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, because, you know, we sort of had Kristen confessing to Alicent on the assumption that Alicent already knew that Kristen had sex with Rhaenyra, when she actually didn't know that. Um, I, I think that, you know, like, assumption, like, I think, like, the failure to communicate is definitely part of this story. Um, you know, I mean, Daemon and Viserys is a big part of that. Um, like, you know, and there's sort of assumptions around, like, the air for a day thing, when Viserys sort of assumed that Daemon was insulting Viserys by referring to his dead baby Balon as the air for a day, when maybe Viserys didn't do that, and, you know, people assume that Daemon killed Rhea Royce, and people assume all sorts of things. Um, I, I think what that ties into is, like, the tragic failure to communicate. Like, people fail to understand each other, and that leads to conflict. Thanks for the super chat from Shinoblest, who says, Did we just see Mushroom? Um, yeah, so there was that dwarf drummer, who might be the jester from the books. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Rahul, who says, Why change the only two actresses they build up? Worst episode this season, says Rahul. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, we'll, we'll discuss the actor changes later on. Thanks for the super chat from Tank, who says, I don't think the Maester conspiracy is about the Hightowers, I think it's about killing the dragons. Well, that's what a character says in book four of Game of Thrones. Uh, Jake in the super chat says that Viserys has leprosy, according to his actor. I didn't see that. I don't know what he's got, but he seems very unwell. Thanks for the super chat from Winterfell Forever, who says, Daemon has all the signs of being a sexual sadist, one who can't get it up or consummate unless he's dominant and inflicts pain on his partner. Can't fathom how so many fangirls find him hot. I think that if 
Daemon Targaryen was played by anyone other than Doctor Who, he would probably be less liked. Um, I don't see any evidence of Daemon being a, like a sadist sexually, but um, yeah, we have seen him being sexually frustrated a lot for sure. Thanks for the super chat from Seven, who says, Love the look of high tide, like Mont Saint-Michel in France, a castle on the water for the Sea Lord. Yeah, this is the castle that um, Corlys Velaryon built to replace the sort of older castle. Uh, they used to be just like a driftmark castle, but it was sort of old and drafty and damp. So Corlys is like, fuck it, I'm going to use my wealth to build a new cool castle. And I love how we got to see all of Corlys's like trophies and souvenirs from all of his travels. He's got this like giant like nautilus shell or something in the background, which is super cool. And he got like the crab feeders mask. Uh, he he placed it as a new trophy among all of his other trophies. So Corlys is very proud of his accomplishments, and I liked seeing all of his uh, a, 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 another mask for his collection, all of his cool stuff. Um, I liked how we got to see the drift, the driftwood throne, which is the throne of the of the Valerion lords, uh, and the throne was supposedly given to the Valerions by um, by the Merlin king because there are uh, bloody mermaids in the lore of Game of Thrones. Seemingly, uh, yeah, I love that giant shell. That that is very cool. That feels quite sort of fantasy e to me. Like I don't think there are. Um, seashells that big in the real world as far as I know uh, so I really enjoy his trophy room it gives it gives us a sense of who Corliss is thanks for the super chat from Reese, who says maybe the Weirwood's death calls the White Walkers ooh cause yeah like we did see the Weirwood tree in this episode and um, it is weird to see a Weirwood tree in the Red Keep cause there isn't one in the books and uh, and Reese is saying that maybe the death of the Weirwood is the reason why the White Walkers came. Because it is still a mystery in the books and the show why the White Walkers turned up after all these thousands of years of, of not being around. What caused the White Walkers to come? And there's a lot of different theories. Maybe it was the birth of the prince that was promised. Maybe it was the Starks leaving Winterfell. Maybe it was the death of the dragons. Maybe it's just the natural seasonal magical tides changing. Um, maybe it's a promise being broken. Maybe it's something about... Maybe it's Lyanna Stark being buried in the Winterfell crypts. There's a million different theories on why the White Walkers came now. Maybe because there's no longer a Targaryen on the throne. Lots of possibilities. Trees are White Walker repellent, says Vang Pao. Maybe, maybe. Um, thanks for the super chat from Peyton, who says, shouldn't Kristen get in a lot of trouble for murdering Joffrey Lonmouth? Yeah, I think he should. Uh, but a lot of people have been getting away with a lot of stuff under King Viserys, so it would not be the first time that someone, you know, it's like Daemon has gotten away with all sorts of shit. So yeah, I, I think Kristen should be punished. Thanks for the super chat from Sashin, who says, knowledge is power, power is power. Yeah, that's an interesting comparison, because, like, in um, Game of Thrones Season 2, Peter Baelish said to Cersei that, you knowledge is power, I know things, I can control things because I have knowledge. And Cersei was like, fuck you, like, power is power, I have the power of violence, and the power of violence beats knowledge every time, so fuck you, Littlefinger. And yeah, I guess that is a bit similar to, like, when, um, when Joffrey Lonmouth comes up to Kristen and says, I know your secret, I know your secret about how you, you had sex with Rhaenyra. Um, and in a similar way to Littlefinger, uh, Kristen says, no, fuck you. I, I don't respect the power of your knowledge. I respect the power of my fists. And then he beat Lonmouth to death. So yeah, I, I agree. There is a parallel there. Um, thanks for the super chat from Gosh, who says, very proud of Daemon for not just starting to kill those randoms with Dark Sister for no reason when the brawl began. <laughs> That's true. That That shows an unusual amount of restraint for Daemon Targaryen, that, that he was in a situation of violence and he was not the most violent person there. Da Daemon did not murder a bunch of his rivals despite having the opportunity. Th this, is, this is a conflict that Daemon was not the instigator of. 
Uh, like that's the thing like i think daemon is getting a run for his money in terms of being the most violent chaotic asshole in the room because normally daemon is the guy who starts all the fights and daemon is the guy who starts the shit but for once there was someone stupider and more violent than daemon was and it was kristen cole which you know what will what potential relationship is there between kristen and daemon you know like they both have been like sometime lovers of rainiera um D- Damon and Kristen are both violent, proud, arrogant dudes. And you know, like 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 L- Lenor is a fighter and Harwin is a fighter and th- there's a lot of dudes with big swords and big energy in the room and uh I mean talk about dragon energy. <laughs> Damon's got it. Thanks for the super chat from Wonga, who says the Raya Royce scene felt like they were spamming the camera button in uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 cinematic mode. I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll leave that for the gamers to interpret. Thanks for the super chat from Michael, who says thoughts on Lightbringer being Aegon's dagger and the prophecy of Nissa Nissa. Uh, yeah, all right. Well... Last episode, we had the uh, quote-unquote cat spore dagger being placed in the fire and it had an inscription from Aegon's prophecy. And none of that is in any of the books. That's a show invention. Um, but what it might maybe connect to is the idea of Lightbringer in the Game of Thrones books, which is the sword that is expected to be used by the Chosen One, the hero Azor High, to defeat the White Walkers. Uh, and, you know, in the books, there's this whole Nissa Nissa story about the hero killing his beloved wife in order to forge the sword that will save the world. Um, and I guess some people are speculating that in some sense, the cat's paw blade might play the role of Lightbringer. Uh, because the cat's paw blade that Arya uses to kill the Night King sort of plays the role of Lightbringer. I mean, I, I think that if there's a Nissa Nissa moment in the Game of Thrones show, it's when Jon kills Daenerys. Um, that is like the hero killing his beloved wife. The only trouble with this in the show is that um, <laughs> Jon kills Daenerys after the White Walkers are defeated. So, like, it doesn't seem to connect. I, I think that that is something that will be very different in the books. Um, so is the cat's paw blade Lightbringer? I, pff, eh, like, I guess. Like, I think Arya might be Lightbringer, if anything, or the dragons might be Lightbringer, but I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not a huge fan of the cat's paw dagger stuff because, like, I, I don't see how it fits with the lore in the books. Like, I think it's mostly just a visual symbol that they're using just to indicate that, you know, the stakes are high, there is an apocalyptic threat, the Targaryens are important. I think that's probably all it's meant to be as far as the show goes, but um, we'll see how it, we'll see how it develops. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Devin the Doppler, who says, when they zoom in on the weirwood tree face, I always got the feeling that Bran slash the Three-Eyed Raven is watching whatever's happening. Yeah, that's a good point, because, like, in the scene with the weirwood, there is a moment where we see the face of the heart tree we see the weeping weirwood face which is which is in all the god's woods um and yeah that was a really like distinct moment of ooh, the weirwoods are watching which we said in the previous old shift x video didn't we um and there is reason to think that bran stark or the three-eyed raven three-eyed crow blood raven uh, might be watching because there is a bit of a timey-wimey element with the weirwoods isn't there uh, because Bran saw through time in Game of Thrones Season 6. He saw, like, Hodor's origin story through time and space. So it's good that we've got a Time Lord on hand in Matt Smith uh, to help us through all of this time travel stuff. Um, and there are a few moments in the Game of Thrones books when there's a bit of time travel shenanigans, like um, Bran speaks to Theon through the Weirwood trees, and it seems like that might be a bit of a time travel thing, like future Bran is talking to present Theon. Bran also talks to Jon Snow through, like, a weirwood dream. Um, so, yeah, like, there is a bit of timey-wimey stuff. So my point is that it is plausible um, that Bran Stark and Bloodraven and other green seers could potentially be watching the things that happen uh, in front of the weirwood tree in the Red Keep. And it would not be crazy if there was some kind of um, intervention there, some kind of whisper from the old gods. So, uh, you know, there, there's definitely potential with that weirwood tree there. Yeah. 
Thanks for the super chat from Sodom, who says, Who threw Lenor on the table? Who kept him away? Yeah, so when the big brawl started, um, Kristen attacked uh, Joffrey Lonmouth. But we don't see exactly what happened. Like, there was this big scrum, and then Lenor got, like, thrown onto the table out of the way. Uh, I guess it's possible that that was just, like, Kristen knocking Lenor to the side so that he could attack attack Joffrey. Or, I mean, maybe Joffrey was throwing Lenor aside so that, you know, in order to protect his boyfriend. Um, yeah, it looks like Lenor is, like, shoving Kristen here. So, uh, you know, I guess Kristen started it and Lenor tried to fight back, but he was tossed aside and then Kristen killed Joffrey. It's so fucked up just beating him to death with his fists. Jesus Christ. I'm pretty sure you would, like, break your fingers if you punched someone in the head enough times to turn it into into fucking uh, uh, mush. I, it was like that ridiculous moment where um, Jon Snow beat Ramsay to death uh, in Winterfell, which was one of, one of my less favorite bits in the Game of Thrones show, personally, because he punched him, like, 30 times. It's like, re like, like, really? Do we really need... Really? That would do as much damage to your hands as to his face. Anyway, um, thanks for the super chat from Amber, who says, Does King Viserys have grayscale? What was that? Yeah, it, it did look like there was some sort of weird stuff on his arm. Like, his arm is looking a bit weird. Maybe that is, like, the, like the poultice, like the treatment that they might be giving him. Um, but then again, Melos said, nah, just give him the leeches. I guess that's just, like, infected gangrenous skin is what that is. Like, it may be that Viserys is, like, repeatedly getting more and more cuts on his body, um, from, from the Iron Throne. Um, so it's possible that that is, is, is what's contributing to his skin being all bad. But yeah, I think he's just got some deep, bad infection. I don't know if the specific disease really matters. I, I, the, the, the point is that he's dying. I don't think it's grayscale. I mean, the thing about grayscale is that it's contagious. I mean, there are different forms of grayscale. But if, like, Viserys' grayscale was progressing, I think he might be infecting other people with grayscale. I, I don't think it's grayscale. I think the only reason the crab feeder had the grayscale was to make him look cool. Thanks for the super chat from Levi, who said, Do you think Joffrey said something else to Kristen that finally set him off? Or was it just a combination of everything that happened? My interpretation is that Kristen was just so emotional and so overwhelmed with guilt and fear, and he was suicidal, and it's just like, he, he just did not know what to do with his feelings, and since he is a warrior, he's a man of violence, violence is all he knows, that's how he expressed his feelings. That's how I interpret it. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Dopey Dragon, who says, Many blessings to Rhaenyra and Lenor. May they have many children. I hope they have a great wedding. Thanks for the super chat from Kevin, who said, Did you notice hints of the Light of the Seven song during Alicent's entrance? That was a rather green scene <laughs> during Game of Thrones as well. Yeah, so what Kevin is saying is that uh, we, we heard the song Faith of the Seven or Light of the Seven um, in Game of Thrones Season 6, Episode 10, when Cersei blew up the uh, Baylor's Sept with wildfire, and you're right, there was a lot of green going along in that shot, just as there is a lot of green when Alicent walks in in her green dress. What would happen if Alicent got her hands on some wildfire? If Alicent got her hands on some wildfire, I think Rhaenyra would be in danger of getting singed. Uh, thanks for the super chat from SK, who says, does this mean that Lil Christy, MC Christian Cole, is an old gods worshipper. Yeah, I do think it's a curious choice that Kristen went to the godswood and the weirwood tree in order to commit suicide. I, I would think that it would make more sense for Kristen to go to the Sept of the Faith of the Seven because Stormlanders and Dornish follow the Faith, not the old gods, generally. Um, and the Sept is also a place where Alicent goes, you know? And the Sept could be in the Red Keep. Like, there is a royal Sept in, in the Red Keep, I think. Um, so, yeah, I think it's an interesting choice. And, like, with Weirwoods, there's always the undertone of blood sacrifice. Um, because, you know, in the books, they talk about how Weirwood trees... Um, 
the first men used to make blood sacrifice to the weirwood trees. Like the weirwood trees are like beautiful and they're sacred, but they're also kind of terrifying and monstrous and manipulative and hive mindy and evil. Um, and I really love this art by Lauren K. Cannon of a weirwood tree. A weirwood tree full of bones, because there was this ancient practice where the first men would put the corpses of their enemies onto the weirwood tree as an offering, and the blood of their corpses would feed the weirwood tree. Um, there's bones and corpses feeding the tree, and the trees are feeding off death, and they are zombie trees, and they're petrified trees, and it's all very sort of dark and ominous and i think that when Kristen is preparing to commit suicide before the weirwood tree he is you know gonna give his blood to the tree you know and i think that there is a sense of like living on in the tree because the old gods are the spirits of the dead living on inside the weirwood hive mind so hell like maybe Kristen is performing like a little bit of a religious self-sacrifice to the old gods here because it would not be the first time that a you know, a, a non-Stark, a non-Northerner, a non-First Man um, would would do something before a tree like that. Because in uh, Game of Thrones Season 1, Episode 7, Samuel Tully, who is from The Reach, says, uh, fuck it, I'll, I'll, I'll pray to the tree. I'll swear my Night's Watch oath before the Weirwood tree, even though that's not his religion. Um, he chooses to forsake his father's gods and pray to the weirwood instead because he didn't get any he didn't get any support he didn't get any love he didn't get any validation from from the faith of the seven so he turns to the weirwoods instead so maybe Kristen on some level is doing a similar thing he's like well i've i've fucked up <laughs> i done goofed i failed i broke my oaths um my kingsguard oaths which were probably sworn in like a faith of the seven fashion so maybe I will turn to the mercy of the old gods instead. That yeah, that would not be a crazy or unprecedented thing to do. I think that's a that's a cool possibility. Um, thanks for the super chat from Elena, who says honestly can't stand Alicent. You seduce Rhaenyra's dad Viserys behind Rhaenyra's back, and then blow up when she lies to you about something that's none of your business. Yeah, I mean, th there's certainly a world where Alicent did not get angry at Rhaenyra in the previous episode. Like, it is an interesting reaction in this scene when Alicent, like, hears the rumor that Rhaenyra hooked up with Daemon, and her reaction is fury at her friend, when, like, Alicent equally could have come to Rhaenyra and said, like, hey girl, like, tell me about last night, like, I hear you had a fun night tell me all about it like wow cool like how was that how was that uncle wang girl um but instead she was really like aggressive and 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 cold and it's like well you know maybe if Alison approached Rhaenyra differently it wouldn't have been so bad and yeah I mean like you say like is Alison really one to talk given what happened with you know Alison getting together with Viserys behind Rhaenyra's back and I mean you know <sighs> Viserys told Alicent not to tell Rhaenyra about their meetings. So Alicent was obeying her king and she was obeying her father, Otto. And so, you know, I think it's, you know, like it is sad that Alicent didn't tell Rhaenyra about her relationship with Viserys, but like it makes sense, I think. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, you can make the argument that like Alicent broke Rhaenyra's heart by secretly having this relationship with Viserys and not telling her. And in the same way, um, you know, Rhaenyra felt betrayed that uh, that uh, Alicent felt betrayed about Rhaenyra, but it's like, well, you sort of did the same thing. So maybe Alicent shouldn't be so angry with Rhaenyra. But I think part of the context there is that, you know, Alicent feels so trapped with like her, her life as Viserys' wife. And she feels so sort of lonely and and cold and she's got these horrible like obli ob obligatory sex scenes with Viserys and like she looks she looks so sad whenever she's holding her baby <laughs> it's so sad like there was a shot in this episode as well where where Alicent was holding her baby and she was just looking so just tired and just down um so I think that all of those feelings are sort of part of why Alison is angry at Rhaenyra, you know? Like, I, I, this story is about people making just, like, emotional decisions. So, like, you know, you, you can't expect everyone to be totally rational and, and enlightened all, all the time. Um, it, it's very much about 
grudges and heartbreak and lust and ambition. That is that is what this is about. And yeah, Alison is about duty. Alison is religious. There's a lot of reasons why Alison would be mad at Rhaenyra. Thanks for the super chat from Habub and from Sam and from William who's, and from Mace and from Wilburger. Go check out Wilburger's uh, Elder Scrolls videos. Wilburger says, another happy wedding. Can we talk about Daemon's need to be powerful in all his relationships? His sexual dysfunction seems to be related to that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that that's what the showrunners said in the previous episode. That, like, part of the reason why Daemon stopped hooking up with Rhaenyra was because Daemon felt like he was no longer in control of the situation. And he, and he felt threatened by Rhaenyra's enthusiasm and passion. So I think Daemon feels like, you know, for him to have sex, he feels like he needs to be in charge. Which almost, if if I were to speculate haphazardly, like maybe Daemon had a bad sexual experience once. Maybe he was sexually assaulted and he was in a situation where he didn't have control and maybe he was traumatized by not having control and maybe Daemon feels like he needs to be in control because of some traumatic thing that happened to him. That There's some wild, unfounded speculation for you. But yeah, like, the showrunners have talked about the idea that Daemon needs to be in control. And I think that Rhea Royce is not someone who would have submitted to Daemon's control. Um, and that's why, that's part of why Daemon sort of failed sexually with Rhaenyra, with, with Rhea and with Rhaenyra, perhaps. But yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's ambiguous. It's interesting. Thanks for the super chat from Iknuiki, who says, Jason Lannister thinks he's smart mocking women in front of Rhaenyra and the king because Lannisters are just so condescending. Yeah. A, a comparison I wanted to make was between Kristen Cole and Jamie Lannister because Jamie Lannister is also a talented warrior who becomes a Kingsguard and breaks his Kingsguard vows in Jamie's case, by hooking up with his sister Cersei. Uh, and, you know, Kristen is similar in that how he breaks his vows hooking up with Rhaenyra. Um, and I think that, you know, when Kristen is, is saying, like, you know, I don't want to soil my cloak, I don't want to be your whore, like, I think in a way, Kristen is saying, I don't want to be Jamie. And, you know, Kristen doesn't know Jamie. Jamie comes much later. But, like, what kind of a life would Kristen live? if for the rest of his life he was a king's guard knowing that he had it was a lie knowing that he broke his oath knowing and, and being used sexually by rainiera like wouldn't that make you bitter wouldn't that make you cynical wouldn't that make you like jamie if you were in that situation like what kind of a person would you become wearing this proud noble king's guard armor knowing the whole time that you besmirched that armor you know and obviously, you know, you can argue that it shouldn't matter. Uh, that that false construct of, like, chastity in Kingsguard is, is just destructive and dumb anyway. Uh, there's a long history in the real world of, like, organizations that, that preach chastity, not following the rules of chastity, and sometimes doing fucked up shit as a result. Uh, you know, I, I think that living living the King's God as a lie would be a really messed up thing to do, and we we saw how that fucked with Jamie, and I, we can imagine that Kristen might have been put in a bad situation. But obviously, like you know, the way that Kristen reacted in this episode was 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 even worse. You know, ki- killing yourself rather than living a lie, I, I, you know, is is the only thing worse. You know. Anyway, um, thanks for the super chat from Eric, who says Raya Royce didn't just fall. Her horse fell on her. I like the setup of the fight. Yeah, yeah, well, I think there's interesting ambiguity with Rhea and Daemon, you know? Like, what were Daemon's intentions here? Uh, you know, she reached for the bow before Daemon stepped forward. Um, it, it sort of reminds me in Game of Thrones Season 4 when Tyrion approaches Shay. Well, well Shay draws a knife and then Tyrion strangles her to death. So it's sort of this thing of, like, can you argue that Tyrion was defending himself? Can you argue that Daemon was defending himself? Uh, whereas in the books, Tyrion totally just murdered the shit out of Shay, Just cold-blooded murder. Like, there was, there was no weapon in 
the books when Tyrion killed Shay. So I, I sort of dislike that change in the, in Game of Thrones. Anyway, thanks for the super chat from Wealth Wolf, who says, "Ladies, don't you hate it when your lover commits a hate crime against your husband's lover and doesn't even have the decency to commit seppuku afterwards?" Thank you for the input, Wealth Wolf. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Ha420 Weed Number, who says, Damon can't get it up because he's getting that spicy noodle from Caraxes. Well, look, I mean, we have seen murals in this episode of dragons having sex with Targaryens. It would not be unprecedented. Thanks for the super chat from Chris, from Marek, and from Jen, who notices that Damon did not stand up in acknowledgement of Alicent coming in in her green dress. Thanks for the super chat from Talk, who says, Could Laris be skin changing into the rats like Blood Raven with the crows? Now, that is a theory I like, Talk Wheeler. Yeah, because Laris somehow knew about the moon tea that Melos gave to Rhaenyra. How did he know? There are all sorts of hints and suggestions about, like, there's secret passages in the Red Keep, there are spies, there are little birds. Lots of different, you know, the walls have ears, the weirwoods are watching, you know, there's lots of different ways to listen in on conversations. And Lara Strong is an observant, observant man. Maybe he's a skin changer and he's walking into these rats that we've seen throughout the series. Um, it's not crazy. I mean, like, you know, uh, Blood Raven was a skin changer. Um, he was the son of a Blackwood, and the Blackwoods have the blood of the first man. So it's not just Starks, and not just Northerners, who have skin-changing warg blood. It's potentially anyone with, like, first man blood. I mean, you know, the Royces, House Royce, um, are a first man house. The first man are, like, the, uh, first human ethnic group in Westeros before the Andals arrived and then the Targaryens arrived and the and the Rhoynar arrived. There's been like multiple waves of migration to Westeros. Um, and, you know, I guess it's plausible that, I mean, I mean the Strongs are like an ancient, are, are the Strongs first men? I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but they're certainly an ancient house. It's very plausible that the Strongs could have first... No, yeah, no, the Strongs are Andals, I think. But it is very plausible that, you know, there might have been some intermarriage with some First Men. There might have been some intermarriage with the Blackwoods, since they're in the Riverlands. I think there's definitely possibilities that Lara Strong could have, um... Could have a bit of skin changer blood. Like Bran. Like Blood Raven. Um, there's no proof in the books of Laris doing that. But I would say that there's, there's, there's some room in that, you know, there's some possibilities. Laris is a mysterious dude. So we'll find out, uh, we'll find out more about him as the story goes on. Thank you for the super chat from Mark who says, why did Kristen do what he did in the end? Was the subtext that Lenor's boyfriend was blackmailing him and he didn't want to be Rhaenyra's side dick? Yes. L Lenor's boyfriend, Joffrey Lonmouth, was blackmailing Kristen by saying, Hey, I know your secret, so you better not tell our secret, or I'll tell your secret that you bone boned the princess. So yeah, like, partly it was a, a reaction to being blackmailed. But I don't think that Joffrey really meant it in that super hostile way. I think Joffrey was mostly just saying, like, hey, like... I'm in the same boat as you. Like, we both are side pieces here, you know? We are both the secret lovers of the princess and the king consort, uh, or future king consort, respectively. So, I, I, you know, I think Joffrey was trying to be, like, chill about it. Like, there, there, there was a bit of a threat there, but I think that he was mostly trying to be like, hey, we're in the same boat, but Kristen decided to react by beating him to death. So, yeah. Um... Thanks for the super chat from Jess, who says, interesting tension between Lena and Damon. Yeah, I think they had a dance there. I really want to see more from Lena, Lena um, Valerion. She, she has, like, grown up a whole bunch. Uh, we saw her talk about breakfast at High Tide. That's about as, uh, uh, that's about as much as we've seen from her. Uh, but, you know, j j just to be clear... This is Lena Valerion, and she was the little girl who Viserys uh, uh, declined marriage to in episode two. This is this is Lena Valerion, and she has now grown up, um, and I hope to see more from her. Thanks for the super chat from Enigmatic Engineer, who says Sir Pounce wouldn't stand for those rats. 
Also, this show doesn't really make the Targaryens look good. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like the entire book Fire and Blood uh, does not make uh, the Targaryens look good. I mean, the reason why the book is called Fire and Blood is because it's full of all of the blood that the Targaryens shed and the fire that they burn with. I mean, the Targaryens are all about, like, power, violence, ambition, and Game of Thrones is so much about the horrors that result from fire and ambition, you know? And that is very much true of this story as well. So, uh, yeah, like, y y <laughs> you're not going to come out of this story going like, wow, I love Targaryens. I'm, I'm all pro-monarchy. Like, yeah, no, that's that's not that's not how you're likely to feel about this. But, like, you know, I think that what's great about this show compared to the book especially is that we're really seeing the feelings and the motivations that underpin uh, the, the terrible decisions that are being made. Um... Milo Minder, Milo Minderbinder in the super chat says, Was the House Mud character last episode the same person as Sir Royce in this episode? Uh, no. No, I, I don't think it was. Um, this fella is the uh, Royce guy. He had that big bushy beard. Um, and he is not the same person as the Royce fella um, in this episode, who we... Uh, can I pull up a picture of him? I reckon I can. This is the Royce guy. So yeah, they do have um, big bushy beards, but they are different fellas. But uh, look, I like that you're keeping an eye out, Milo. I like that you're keeping an eye out for the inevitable ascendancy of House Mud. I don't know about you guys. I, I don't know about blacks or greens. I am Team Mud all the way. It makes no sense that this guy claims to be from the long extinct House of uh, House of Mud, but uh, you know, I'm I'm all for him. Uh, I, screw the House of the Dragon. Give me the House of the Mud. Thanks for the super chat from Mark, who says Rhaenyra negging Daemon into murdering everyone and flying off with her was definitely something. They are more alike than she realizes. Yes, I think there are some deep similarities between Rhaenyra and Daemon, for sure. Um, thanks for the super chat from Brennan, who wanted Joffrey to pull a Monty Python. Thanks for the super chat from George, who says, Do you think that Otto's talk with Alicent about the well-being of the realm was genuine? I believed it. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I think that what Otto said is mostly true like yeah like there is almost inevitably going to be conflict when Viserys dies and there's going to potentially be some people supporting Rhaenyra for the throne some people supporting Aegon for the throne Daemon has his own ambitions uh maybe this mud guy is is going to be the real claimant to the throne um and so I think Otto is, is just saying be realistic be pragmatic we got to make the right choices to protect you and your children but again like the only reason why Alicent is in this vulnerable position is because Otto pushed Alicent to hook up with with Viserys in the first place and because Viserys was trying to manipulate and make Aegon the heir so like I think Otto is right that like they've got to be real about this dangerous situation but I think that Otto in so many ways engineered this dangerous situation um, thanks for the super chat from Mineth, who says, Honestly, this episode just shows that love doesn't have a place in ruling, with Kristen Cole representing love. Yeah, I mean, Game of Thrones is always so much about the dangers of mixing, uh, political responsibilities with emotional desires. Like, you know, that's true of Jon Snow and Ygritte. Um, and, you know, Aemon tells Jon Snow... You must kill the boy and let the man be born. And so, like, you know, sometimes, like, being a good ruler and being a good man means, like, sacrificing your personal emotional desires for the good of the realm. Um, and John does that when he, you know, fights against the wildlings and, and Ygritte gets killed. Um, so, you know, maybe Rhaenyra, if she wants to be a good ruler, she's just got to, like, accept that she can't be, like, you know getting some side dick from a king's guard, she needs to be focused on her responsibilities because if she doesn't, the white walkers are going to destroy the world. If the if if they don't marry the right people, if they don't love the right people, if they don't protect this bloodline and their political stability, then maybe the white walkers will win in the end, you know? So there are apocalyptic consequences to all of this adultery which uh, raises the stakes. Uh 
Sparty is a fan of Harwin Strong saving Rhaenyra. Eugenio says, isn't it clear that the, that the disease Viserys has is diabetes? He's got unhealable wounds, and his love for wine, his escapism is killing him. Yeah, well, he does eat too much in the book, but yeah, I'm not going to attempt to diagnose him. Uh, Antoine says, why did Lenor bring his fuck buddy to his wedding? Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> it seems to be kind of an open secret, like Lenor and um, Joffrey's relationship. I mean, it's a little bit like uh, Loras and Renly, and then Loras and his other lovers. Um, it's it's not top secret because I think that when you're powerful enough, you can get away with stuff. I mean, Lenor rides a dragon, you know. So like, what are you gonna do? <laughs> like, insult Lenor for for adultery and and you know be homophobic? He's got a dragon. <laughs> I, I think you can get away with a lot when you've got a dragon. I mean, George Martin has said as much. Like, when the Targaryens have dragons, they can pretty much marry who they want. It's a lot easier to get away with polygamy and incest when you have a dragon. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Jared. What did Daemon do during the brawl? Yeah, that's not very clear. Um, thanks for the super chat from Mineth and Gnostic who says that reminds me of Ovid's Metamorphosis, the gathering of the trees, or the birth of Adonis, when Mira becomes a tree and weeps sap. Thanks for the super chat from Hannes and Nelly, who says when Hobart arrived, they announced him as the voice of Old Town, perhaps a slight confirmation that the Hightowers do have strong influence with maesters. Uh, I mean, the home of the maesters is called the Citadel. Um... So uh, they didn't mention the Citadel. And calling him the voice of Old Town is just acknowledging him that they rule the city of Old Town. Thanks for the super chat from Clancy, who says Kristen is... <laughs> okay. Thanks for the super chat from Gizka, who says, What's the deal with Laris Strong? Does he have a goal or does he live for the drama? I think he has political ambitions because he he sets himself up as like an ally to Alicent, saying, oh, perhaps you're in need of an ally. And he like turns her against Rhaenyra. So I think Laris's uh, goals are mysterious, but I think he's ambitious. I mean, I think one open question is like, what what is the deal between like Laris and his father, Lionel Strong? Lionel Strong is the Lord of Harrenhal. Um, does Lionel know about Laris's manipulations here? Like, did Lionel say, like, hey, Laris, you should totally go and tell Alicent about the moon tea and create division? Or is Laris just doing his own thing? Because it would be really interesting if, like, Lionel Strong was, like, pretending to be, like, super supportive of Viserys and super unbiased and just doing the right thing. Uh, when secretly he's using his son Laris to actually create division and fuck around. I think that would be a really interesting dynamic. Um, does Laris tell his brother Harwin Strong, Breakbones, about his manipulations? You know, like, is Laris working alone or in concert with everyone else? I think that's a interesting open question. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Milo, who says... Uh, yeah, well, that's a bit spoilery. Thanks for the super chat from... Courtney, who says the last name conversation was interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we we discussed that. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Rebecca, who says, I love the wings on the show, but Matt Smith's was horrible. Oh, you mean the wigs? Yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, <laughs> the, the, the wigs in House of the Dragon have gotten mixed reviews. Not everyone likes the wigs. Um, I, I don't care too much, personally. Um, I haven't noticed the wigs looking horrible. Sometimes, like, the hairline above the brow looks a bit wrong. Uh, apparently there's been a shortage of hair for wigs. Uh, it's an issue in Rings of Power as well. Yeah, I don't know much about it. Um, thanks for the super chat from Lady Eternal, who says that Viserys only rode Beleriand once and never claimed another dragon because of his gnarly motion sickness. <laughs> yeah, that's... That's a good theory. Um, because Viserys did once ride Beleriand the Black Dread, which was the biggest and baddest dragon in the world. Um, but then Beleriand died of old age, and uh, Viserys never rode another dragon. Um, you might you might suspect that maybe the Maesters secretly killed Beleriand. That's what really happened. Beleriand didn't die, the Maesters got him. Maybe the Maesters leeched Beleriand one too many times. Um, but yeah, Beleriand died and then Viserys never rode again. 
Um, and now he seems sort of afraid of dragons. So yeah, maybe Viserys' aversion for dragons is because he gets some real nasty seasickness. Um, I, I really, like, it, it did look kind of crazy, like, when, uh, Melis and Sea Smoke were flying around. They were flying really fast. Like, like, Melis, like, swooped the fuck down from the sky. Like, look at this, they're going, like, Mach 10. Like, holy crap, your insides would turn into fucking jelly. You would be liquefied operating at <laughs> those kinds of G-forces. I think, realistically, no matter how good your saddle is. Um... So yeah, maybe Viserys just got really dragon sick and that's why he doesn't ride. But I mean, the other angle is that um, no one has ever ridden multiple dragons. People only ever ride one dragon. Dragons can have multiple riders, um, one after the other, but there's only ever been one dragon bonded to one person so far. So, you know, Viserys, I don't think, had the option of um, taking another dragon. Thanks for the super chat from... Osh, who said, I didn't like Krispy Kreme going crazy at the party. Yeah, it, it, it got a bit crazy. And, and, I, and I did prefer in the books when Kristen kills Joffrey at a tournament melee, because that is more sort of forgivable. It's more, it, it sort of makes sense. So yeah, I, I agree. I would have preferred if it was at a tournament. And I enjoy Krispy Kreme being the new name for Kristen Cole. I, I like that nickname. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Marissa, who says, shocked that Alison wore green at a wedding instead of at a tournament. Yeah, I mean, they decided to combine the tournament with the wedding. They decided to compress it. They have to simplify things for their show. But yeah, I agree. Like, it is crazy that he killed him at the wedding. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Kawaii, who says, impressed with the writing of Alison's turn. Thanks for the super chat from Musa, who says, Otto is a piece of work. Yeah, 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 I, I agree, Musa, that Otto, like, created the problem of this Alicent versus Rhaenyra conflict, and then he sort of, like, blames Alicent for not handling the conflict that he put her in. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Moral, who says, It's interesting to see the designs and power of House Hightower compared to the lack of screen time of their overlords, House Tyrell. It shows the strategic importance of Old Town. Yeah, because um, cause the Hightowers are this super important family, but they are not the most... They are not officially the most powerful house in the Reach. Officially, the Tyrells, uh, as in, like, Marjorie Tyrell and Olena Tyrell and Mace Tyrell and Loras Tyrell, they are the overlords of the Reach, and the Hightowers are sworn to obey the Tyrells. And yet, it seems like the Hightowers are probably more powerful than the Tyrells, really. And that, and that comes from their history, because originally the Gardeners, House Gardener, ruled the Reach, but then Aegon the Conqueror killed the Gardeners when he conquered Westeros. And so after Aegon killed the Gardeners, he was like, uh, all right, who should I put in charge of the Reach? And the Tyrells were like, oh, me, 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 we should be in charge of the Reach. And Aegon's like, okay, fine, you're in charge of the Reach. I don't care. Let's go. Um, and that that has caused a bit of, a bit of, bit of conflict because like some people like the Florence say that, oh, we should rule the Reach and the Hightowers think, oh, we should rule the Reach. Um, and so there's always a bit of jostling and a bit of conflict in the Reach when tension in the Reach, when other houses think they should be in charge. It's not like the Starks who have been in charge of the North for thousands of years. The Tyrells have only been in charge for 115 years at this time. So, yeah, there's definitely some tension there. Thanks for the super chat from Nick, who says, the hardest part to believe is that Viserys will be alive in 10 years. Uh, thanks for the donation from Dude Bro Man Dude, who says, Alison, how is Alison going to get Kristen out, in, out of trouble? Yeah, look, I, I think that in the same way that Daemon keeps getting away with shit, I think Kristen may also get away with shit. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Hen, who says, do you think Kristen thought that Rhaenyra told Lainor and Joffrey about their relationship, hurting Kristen's pride? Yeah, I mean, Kristen does, Kristen made it clear with Rhaenyra that he does not want to be seen as Rhaenyra's whore. That's like an insult to his honor. Um, so yeah, I, I, I guess that, um, maybe Kristen thought that Rhaenyra must have told people that Kristen was her side piece and maybe Kristen felt disrespected and that's part of why he attacked Joffrey. Yeah, that might be part of it. 
Thanks for the super chat from Mike, who says, Speaking of the word fracas, do you think Frank Herbert missed a beat by not calling Dune the fracas on Arrakis? I, I think he truly did. I think he truly did. And uh, hey, hype for uh, Dune Part 2 coming out next year. It's going to be fun making a video about that. Uh, all right, we're going to end this live stream shortly. We've been talking for two and a half hours. Uh, we're going to do a real quick uh, lightning round to answer as many of your super chats as possible. Uh, and then we're going to have a quick look at the preview for next week's episode. And then we'll wrap up the live stream. So please do uh, press the like button and subscribe. You can subscribe to this uh, on the Alt Shift X podcast if you want to listen to these live streams as a podcast. You can also subscribe to the Alt Shift X audio feed so that you can get Alt Shift X videos in audio form in its own podcast feed. All of the links are below. Uh, you can buy an Alt Shift X t shirt if you'd like or a fancy pin. I think you'd look fetching in that Alt Shift X pin at standard.tv slash altshiftx, link below. Uh, and we will, of course, make the explained video. Uh, it'll come out around Friday or Saturday uh, to follow up this live stream. And uh, yeah, let's quickly answer some super chants. So Abyssal says, every time I see the intro, it reminds me of ketchup. Uh, maybe you are just hungry, Abyssal Fires. You may have noticed that the uh, intro sequence has indeed evolved a little bit as the episodes go by. Um, there are now some bloodlines coming off Rhaenyra, which indicates that, you know, her marriage to Laenor and potentially, potentially fruit of that union. Uh, and uh, Alicent over here has multiple bloodstreams coming off her to indicate her multiple children and her marriage to Viserys. I guess that line is her marriage to Viserys. And these are her children, Aegon and her daughter. So yeah, the opening sequence continues to evolve. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Script, who says, was Rhaenyra supposed to be? Yeah, that'll happen later. Thanks for the super chat from Asher, who says, hey, Alt, do you know who In Deep Geek is? And would you collab with him? Yeah, In Deep Geek is a really cool YouTube channel and a lovely guy who does uh, Song of Ice and Fire and Lord of the Rings videos, and you should totally check him out. There are many, there are many, many, many cool, good uh, Game of Thrones channels and, and podcasts and stuff. You all should check out Radio Westeros and History of Westeros and Tony Teflon and Grey Area and LML and Preston and Glidus and... Um, the Disputed Lands and Good Queen Alley on Tumblr and the Not A Cast podcast with Paul Quentin and Manu and uh, Joanna Robinson on The Ringer and uh, many, many more who I can't think of right now. There's, there's lots of good channels to check out. Uh, so please do go check them out and all those podcasts and stuff. Uh, Dopey Dragon says that maybe Kristen is a legitimized vol bastard. A vol? Or are you trying to say veil? I'm not sure what you're trying to say, Dopey Dragon. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Equinox, who says the rats in the background indicate that the Red Keep really needs a rat catcher. Interesting observation, Equinox. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Lady and Kingsgrave. Kingsgrave says, as a, as a disabled man, I love the trope of disabled schemers. And it seems like George R. R. Martin is also a fan of it. Yeah, George R. R. Martin has a lot of people who are like physically not... Uh, what's the terminology? George Martin has lots of people who are not like physically able and who have other great talents. And, you know, Tyrion Lannister is obviously a big example of that. Um, he's a dwarf, but he's super smart and has all the, all of these other strengths and qualities. And there's like Willis Tyrell, and the, and he also has a lot of like very fat people who like are not very capable because they're very fat, but they're also very like smart and capable. And so like Wyman Manderley is an example of that in the books. He's like not very impressive physically, but he has a lot of other talents and like Varys and like all sorts of people who have physical shortcomings, but uh, have other skills. Thanks for, and you know, Lara Strong, the clubfoot is part of that. Thanks for the super chat from Breya, 
who says maybe Damon acts out because he can never get it off. Look, I think I think raw sexual frustration might be half of Damon's motivations. He's got like a chronic case of blue balls and uh, just just cannot cannot chill. There are a lot of characters in this show who cannot chill. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Archibald, who says that Kristen Cole's indignance about the idea of being Rhaenyra's whore, when he literally took an oath of chastity to become a Kingsguard, he should have just played along. Yeah, he should have just played along. But I mean, maybe Kristen felt like he had to have sex with Rhaenyra because he was, she was her princess. She was her princess. He was, he was, she was his princess. Um, yeah, but yeah, Kristen, Kristen has a lot of feelings and he doesn't handle them very well. Thanks for the super chat from Bram, who says that have we discussed the murals of lemon trees around the God's Wood? Lemon trees? Were there murals of lemon trees? Oh, yeah, there's a mural of a lemon tree. You're right. Interesting. There is a whole uh, lemon controversy in the Game of Thrones books, because Daenerys Targaryen remembers growing up in a house that has a lemon tree. Uh, which is weird because some people say there are no trees in Bravos, or specifically that citrus trees do not grow in the cold climate of Bravos, and yet Daenerys thinks that this house is in Bravos. So some people are like, there must be a conspiracy. She must have actually been at a house in Dawn as part of the Martell plotline. So lemons are certainly an interesting thing to appear in, on this mural. Good, good eye. Good eye, uh, Bram. Thanks for the super chat from Ruben and from Patrick uh, and from Chris and from Helvec. Uh, uh, yeah, we talked about most of this stuff. Thanks, Wrench Dodger and Princess Lioness and Sean, who says, Why did the Hand send his man to start assaulting what looked like random people. No, no, so Lionel Strong sent his son Harwin to get Princess Rhaenyra out of the violence. That's what ha that's what's happened. Uh, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't Lionel sending Harwin to do more violence. He was trying to just protect the princess, which is a smart thing to do. Thanks for the super chat from Adam, who says, when Viserys was being treated, yeah, 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 it does seem conspiratorial that Melos refused to give Viserys a medical treatment suggested by Maester Orwell. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Wealth Wolf and from Darnell and Jordan and Kota and Inquisitor and Jess who says, do you think Hobart hopes to rise his family above the Tyrells in the long run? Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely some rivalry and some ambitions in the Reach, which might be relevant in the main Game of Thrones books. Uh, Groovy says, Viserys going to Corlys is a bit much. Yeah, so it's interesting that, you know, King Viserys came to Corlys uh, to propose marriage, and, you know, Viserys was kind of offended, or, or Lionel was kind of offended, when the king arrived on Driftmark at high tide, and they're like, where is Corlys? Why is he not greeting the king? I mean, remember, like, in Game of Thrones, season one, episode one, when, like, Robert rocks up, and it's it's a big deal when the king visits your house. Like, you're meant to make a big deal of it. You're meant to welcome him with a big entourage and make a big deal of it. Whereas here, no one welcomed Viserys. And I think partly that is Corlys, Corlys's pride. He wants Viserys to come to him. And so, you know, Corlys was sitting on his driftwood throne and Corlys was standing up on the dais and he was looking powerful, forcing the king to come to him. So I think that was a, absolutely a power move by Corlys um, to sort of lord over King Viserys because he feels insulted about Lena and about Rhaenys. And so, you know, his pride is a, is a huge deal here. And it's really interesting that in Corlys's conversation with Rhaenys, um, Corlys was the one saying, like, hey, like, it's messed up that you're not the queen. Like, you should have been picked at the council at Harrenhal. And Rhaenys was like, like, nah, like, I'm over it. Like, I I'm okay with not being queen. Whereas Corlys is like, no, you should have been the queen. Like, we need to be in charge. So Corlys is the one who's really driving the Valerion ambition, whereas Rhaenys is a bit more chill. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Randall, who says, a lot of people are misunderstanding why Cole snapped. He wasn't angry, he just thought he was going to be tortured and gelded. Well, yeah, but I mean, 
killing Joffrey... Oh, well, okay, so are you saying that he killed Joffrey Lonmouth in order to silence Joffrey Lonmouth, in order to prevent Joffrey Lonmouth blabbing about Rain- about uh, Kristen breaking his vows, and Kristen was trying to save himself, and he was trying to keep his secret by killing Joffrey, to keep the secret so that he didn't get killed? I, I, think, that's an, uh, I think that's a fair interpretation, but I don't think that's what's going on, because Kristen had just told Alicent... He just confessed to Alicent and said, please execute me. And then he went to go and commit suicide by the godswood. So I think Kristen, I don't think he's trying to keep the secret so much as he really is just overwhelmed with emotion and self-destructive. Like, he wants to die at this point. Thanks for the super chat from Hannah. No, I don't think we will see House Dane in this series. But maybe, who knows? Uh, Thanks for the super chat from Joseph, uh, who says, are you a fan of Middle Earth? Um, yeah, but I'm not planning on making Lord of the Rings videos. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Gilly and Pizza, uh, who says, how long will the show go? It might be three or four seasons, according to the showrunners. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Princess Lioness. Um, thanks for the super chat from Ship and Winterfell and Daniel... Daniel asks, why wasn't Kristen Cole wearing a helmet at the feast? I mean, so we can see his face. Like, I I like how, you know, they show these characters wearing helmets in battle a lot of the time. Like, Daemon and Corlys wear helmets, and I like the sort of realism of that. But, you know, they want to be able to see... um, We want to be able to see the characters' faces. Thanks for the super chat from... Savona who says that Kristen had a interesting background with girls and yet doesn't want to be one and done with Rhaenyra. Yeah, it does seem like a little bit hypocritical that Kristen said that he had an adventurous youth, like he was saying that he slept around when he was young, but he chose not to marry anyone. But now Kristen is getting angry at Rhaenyra that she's sleeping around and not marrying him. So yeah, I think there's definitely some hypocrisy there. Thanks for the super chat from Gaston who said, when Daemon stepped on Rhea's arm, wasn't he checking if she still had sensation on her arm to check how severe the paralysis was? Maybe, yeah, maybe he was trying to, like, assess her situation, but, like, I I don't see it as an act of compassion when he kills her with a rock. (laughs) I think this is pretty fucked up murder. Uh, Thanks for the super chat from Masis, who says, the book highlighted the moral ambiguity whereas episodes one to three were clearly Team Targ. Yeah, look, I think people have different opinions about who the good guys are here. Like, I I think, I don't know. Personally, I got a bit of, like, a villain vibe from Alicent walking in. Like, Like, she got, I got, like, Cersei vibes from just her, like, cold, resentful, like like, vindictive power vibe from her. Um, But, you know, I I think that we have seen multiple layers and sides to all of these characters, and I think we will continue to do so. Um, Thanks for the super chat from... What the Tambor? Uh, And from Mike? And from Jazz? We've already answered most of these questions. I don't want to repeat myself too much. Um... Jazz Falcon suggests that Lainor might blame Rhaenyra for the death of Joffrey. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Or or maybe Lainor will find comfort with Rhaenyra. Like, he's grieving his boyfriend at his wedding to Rhaenyra. Maybe Rhaenyra will, will, you know, give him a shoulder to cry on. It'll be really interesting to see what kind of relationship they have. I mean, they seem pretty understanding of each other, right? Um... Austin says, I've noticed in Game of Thrones and this show that none of the Targaryens have ever had good control of their emotions. I mean, the Targaryens are fiery, and some of them have a tendency towards madness and erratic behavior and ambition and pride and love and lust. And also the fact that they have dragons, you know, they're powerful, they're kings and queens. Um, So, yeah, I think that's part of why they are super, they are pretty erratic and they do do some dramatic things. Uh, And that's what, yeah, all the drama is all about. Thanks for the super chat from Hoof, who says, Why wasn't Otto at the wedding? He was the father of the queen. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, maybe Viserys told Otto, you're not welcome at this wedding, you know? Because, yeah, it is weird that the father of the bride isn't there. Uh, Thanks for the super chat from Marcos, who says, Arya destroyed the Song of Ice and Fire prophecy. 
yeah, Arya killing the Night King in Game of Thrones was... Uh, I, I don't think that does fit particularly with the prophecies about the prince that was promised in Azor Ahai, because she's not a Targaryen. And if it's the Targaryen bloodline that they're protecting to fulfill the prince of the prom pro prince that was promised prophecy, I don't see Arya fitting into that. Thanks for the super chat from Banzera. Uh, and thanks for the super chat from Unidan who says, I appreciate them showing actual love between Corlys and Rhaenys, even if they're plotting a bit. Thanks for the super chat from Eric and Virginia, who says, are Alicent's children not sharing cribs with dragon eggs? Yeah, I mean, Alicent's children are Targaryens, Aegon Targaryen and her daughter. Um, shouldn't these true-born children have dragon eggs in their cradle? I mean, maybe they do, we just haven't seen it. Maybe we'll find out. Thanks for the super chat from First Name and from Cullen, who says, if the younger Val Valerion becomes King Consort, who gets Driftmark? Yeah, who does inherit Driftmark? I mean, could Lainor Valerion become Lord of Driftmark and also be the King Consort at the same time? Or will a second child of Lainor and Rhaenyra get Driftmark? Or will Kristen, or will Corliss's brother Vaymond get Driftmark? There's uh, several possibilities there. And inheritance struggles are definitely part of this plot. Thanks for the super chat from Tim, who says, Didn't Krispy Kreme say to Alicent that he felt pressure to sleep with the princess if it was still his choice? Uh, I don't remember that line, but we can check that out later. Uh, and Kaisha says, Every character is grey. And Daniel says, what were the dragons we saw flying to meet the Valerions? Um, so I think that the dragons here are Melis, the Red Queen, the dragon of Rhaenys Targaryen. And this one is Sea Smoke, the dragon of Laenor. I think those were the dragons. Are you saying there were dragons on the way to the Valerions? I don't remember there being dragons here. Yeah. Um, all right. We're going to have a look at the on the next week preview and then we're going to wrap up the live stream. So thank you everyone for participating. Uh, if you don't want to see the next week preview, then you may want to avert your eyes because we're going to look at the on the next episode. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Press like and subscribe and we'll have the explained video out on Friday or Saturday. All right, so on the next episode, we see Caraxes flying like the glorious, awkward, wormy weirdo he is. We see the small council. Everyone's older because this is like, mm, yeah, it's like 10 years later or something. So uh, Lionel Strong has got some gray hairs and Viserys is looking extremely unwell. He's got a much more sparse wig now. Uh, he does not look long for this world. Uh, and we have a new actress for Alicent, and we have a new actress for Rhaenyra, uh, which is going to be crazy, like having these central characters replaced. I hope that, you know, I, I hope that the new actors are as good as the old actors, because uh, I think that um, Millie and uh, Emily did a really good job. So it'll be really cool to see how they handle the, tr the transition to new actors years later. Um, I think that now that we've jumped forward, there's going to be I think there's going to be less big time jumps in future. Uh, this kid, uh, you know, mild spoilers, but I think this is uh, Aemon Targaryen, the uh, third child of Viserys and uh, Viserys and Alicent. And we see Valerion ships, and we see the Lannisters roll up. Oh, we've already seen this stuff. Oh, yeah, that's the wrong bit. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, we, all right, we see this kid tr training with a sword, and this kid with the long blonde hair, I believe, is Aegon Targaryen, the son, the firstborn son of Viserys and Alicent, and this is the kid who the High Towers want to inherit the throne. Uh, that looks like Lena with a child, which is interesting. Who is Lena hooked up with? Uh, Looks like Breakbones is teaching Aegon Targaryen. Yeah, this is Aegon Targaryen, I think. He's going to be uh, potentially a claimant to the throne. You will be our king, says Alicent. We see a dragon egg. Is that... A, is that... Is that Baylor? 
and we see Lena with Damon. How interesting. And we see this child, which is going to be one of the children of Rhaenyra, and her husband, Lenor, of course. We see Harwin break bones some more. Looks like Harwin is fighting against this fella. Is that Kristen and Harwin? Got a, got a boy here. He looks very strong. We got Rhaenyra with another baby. So Rhaenyra's going to have a bunch of kids. And there's going to be a bit of Drakara sing. This is one of the children of Rhaenyra and uh, Lenor with a dragon. So there's going to be more kids. There's going to be more claimants. There's going to be more dragons. There's going to be more fights. And uh, the show's going to change dramatically. My God, it, it, this is sort of like a like a mid-season finale. It's going to be a huge difference between now and the next five episodes. Um, so, uh, my God, it's going to be big. Okay, we've been streaming for a long time. Oh, we got a little small dragon with the dragon keepers. That's cool to see. Oh, and yeah, this is Vega, by the way. This is uh, this is little uh, Lena Valarion riding the biggest dragon in the world, Vega, who looks appropriately enormous. My God, does Vega look big? Vega is like a dinosaur. Vega is a titan, flying with Daemon too. How interesting! Yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be spoiling everything, but um, we've got a lot to look forward to. We've got a lot of new characters. We've got a lot of changes. But all of these grudges and all these conflicts that we saw earlier are going to be super relevant to the whole thing. All right, we're going to wrap it up now. Thanks, guys. Uh, see you next time. Like and subscribe. Check out the podcasts. And uh, we'll get going on the explained video. Cheers.